Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, I'm joined by Mark Zolo, aka The Naughty Nomad, for his second appearance on the podcast. Mark, how's it going, man? How you doing, man? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, a little uh, spiritually depleted from my sailing trip, but uh, otherwise in good spirits. Awesome. And for people who don't know, uh, Mark Zolo was our second guest on the podcast. Our very first episode was the OG Vance, the founder of My Latin Life. And our very second episode, our first guest ever was Mark Zolo. So really happy to have him back. Uh, Mark, for people who don't know you, do you want to give a little background? Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thank, I mean, it's kind of it was an honor to be the first guest on, actually. Um, so, for the guts of uh, my twenties, uh, for over ten years, I ran a website called NaughtyNomad.com. It was basically the number one resource in men's travel. I wrote over a hundred city guides um, for dudes about like where to pick up, and I talked a bit about uh, legal narcotics as well, and um, I traveled to one hundred and twenty countries. I've also written three books. The first one, Naughty Nomad, got to number one on Amazon for travel writing. Then I wrote a book on New York, a guide. And then my latest book, My Life is a Mexican Pirate, uh, pro- my best work, I would say, um, also got to number one on Amazon for adventure travel. And it's just come out on Audible as well. So uh, that took an insane amount of work. I did like a thousand hours, I think well over 50 different accents. It was a serious project i did not expect it to be so big but i'm delighted now it's finally out yes so the former naughty nomad uh you've actually accomplished a lot man i feel in your life you're you're a a owner of multiple pubs you've moved to malta the european island uh you're a musician you have a master's degree and you've sailed around the mediterranean and the caribbean as you mentioned visited 120 countries as well including a lot of the difficult ones um so yeah man uh one of the most interesting guys out there for sure and i think the audience is gonna love this episode oh thanks so much i forgot about all that other stuff <laughs> <laughs> so i had a, a question for you you've, you've always kind of styled yourself as a pirate i guess early on just as a, a costume or kind of as like a conquistador and you just kind of like the motif but when did you actually start learning how to sail so the pirate thing kind of came up as a bit of a joke. Um, I, I, it was after I wrote my my first book, Naughty Nomad. Um, we kind of we kind of did it as a fun weekend thing in in Germany. Uh, this whole Mexican pirate thing. One of my friends wanted to do a, a pub crawl dress as pirates. It was during Oktoberfest, and my other friend wanted to do like um, we dress as Mexicans, and we decided, hey, let's combine the two and be the pirates of the Sangarian. There's a there's a song with that, but uh, let, let's see uh, if we sing it later. But anyway, <laughs> they, it kind of got out of control. And thirty countries... actually, before we move on, you got to give us the song right now. Well, okay. <laughs> well, you see, we wanted to start a party. I'm wondering what to do. We all made our suggestions, and we narrowed it down to two. One <laughs> idea was drink sangria, sombreros, one and all. The other was dressed as pirates. And embark in a pub crawl. But then we all decided, wouldn't it be obscene to combine the two and be the pirates of the Sangarina? Something hey, like that. <laughs> hey, woo. Something like that. There's more to it, but that's the gist, yeah? <laughs> oh man, I love Irish people. And we that's got the gift awesome. of the gab. Yeah. We're a musical <laughs> we're a musical race. The gift of the gab. Random question, have you ever been to the Blarney Stone? No, I have not been to the Blarney Stone because I'm not an American tourist. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Where were we? So where did you uh, actually start to learn how to sail? Um, So it's it's actually kind of a funny story because I kind of want to always try to up the ante with my adventures. And originally I got into microlight planes. So I started training uh, for a microlight license in Northern Ireland uh, to fly these tiny little planes um they're basically like a, a motorbike with uh, with uh, with wings i don't know if you guys have seen them it's it's you're exposed you have a big f- kind of a propeller on the back mm-hmm. if it's two people and it's a paragliding wing so it's it's and you it's very um it's like basically like a, para, a motorized paraglider 
And my, and there was a guy, I believe, who went around the world in one of them. At one point, you have to do in stops along the way. They can only go so far, and they're very prone to uh, bad weather. They they can't um, deal with much. And there, it's not that expensive to buy them. Um, but the problem was the weather in Ireland was always so bad. My flight kept getting cancelled, and I'd have to drive like two hours up to Northern Ireland. The reason why is the the British licensing was mm-hmm. ten hours less than the European licensing. So. But anyway, I tried to redo it in, in Malta as well years later, but just the same problem, just getting lessons. Anyway, I abandoned this plan because um, I thought it wasn't the best way to get around, like travel. I really wanted to do it like maybe in Africa. Um, but firstly, I hate heights. <laughs> so mm. I did, I clocked up a load of hours, um, um, but I, I, I was still terrified doing the whole time. And also just the logistics of landing planes and stuff like that. It just didn't seem that viable, and it seemed like a very, very, very expensive uh, hobby. So then I, I, that kind of was the start of what, uh, when I started looking for alternative means of travel to make it extra adventurous. I was thinking of, oh God, I'd love to do horseback, you know, maybe go through Central America on horseback. Uh, but then again, that comes with all sorts of issues. Then I was thinking about the Caribbean because I was in New York. I was living in New York and I thought, hey, you know, it'd be crazy because we were doing the Mexican pirate thing. I said, what if we go from Miami all the way to Venezuela uh, with jet skis? So you could basically because nowhere is more mm-hmm. than a day sail away. And I worked out the whole logistics of it. Uh, on, when you fill up, you could go between every island. You'd never have to refuel There's because the distances between every island is so small. It's actually viable to do the jet ski thing. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, it'd be a jet ski pirate gang. You know, that'd be fucking crazy. I don't think anyone's done that either. Like, done something so yeah, that'd wild. Be first. Uh, but then I started thinking of what was that like, really? I didn't realize how rough the weather is in the Caribbean. And by the way, when I went there on this sailing trip, I got the shock of my life. But um, but mainly it was like, what happens if something breaks down? You're screwed. You know, uh, your friend will have to tow you. It also, you're also reliant on other people but i started looking into the cost of it and then i was like oh, i wonder if there was three or four of us getting jet skis if we just combine our money what would we do we could buy a buy a sailboat maybe and that's when i kind of went down the rabbit hole and i realized that you can get sailboats pretty cheap and uh i got really excited about this uh, with this idea because not only can you travel for free on the wind you don't have to spend on fuel but also your accommodation is sorted so i was like okay this makes a lot of sense this whole sailing uh, thing so I signed up for a class in New York and sailed the Hudson, did a ASA 101, which is basic keelboat. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I loved it. I really loved the, I love sailing. Um, but then at the end of my time in New York, about two years, I had enough to buy a boat, but didn't have enough to uh, basically fund myself for the whole trip and I had to think about where I was going to store it uh, afterwards. And there was lots of um, variables I hadn't sorted out. My life wasn't really sorted out at that point. Fast forward a couple of years, moved to Malta, uh, got my finances sorted out, set up uh, a bar that led to another bar, another bar, another bar where my, the franchise I founded is four bars strong now, as well as an uh, importing company, import a lot of beers from Poland, also have our own branded beer that I, I actually designed the labels and everything. Um, so build up kind of, uh, also got a, some real estate here as well. So I, I in five years, I built up a pretty decent foundation here. And that was the time to uh, also bought some Bitcoin early on, which is good at around 6.30. So I uh, sold, sold everything now, but I traded it for boat coin. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I took the plunge. First, I bought a boat in Marseille, France. Mm-hmm. In in about two years ago, uh, bought it. Wanted to sail it to Malta, but it was the end of October. The weather was absolutely awful. Uh, had to turn back. Uh, so sorry. First of all, I did a day skipper course uh, in Malta, that which is like a week long course to get me more qualified. And mm-hmm. I went over with my instructor to bring the boat back. It was an Alpha Vega twenty seven. Um, cost me around six and a half thousand. Very cheap, but it's a st- solid solid boat. But the weather was merciless and um you know it was kind of stormy uh we we were getting 30 knots of wind um day three i think it was uh there was a fire in the engine room 
and we had to get rescued from the Sardinian Coast Guard. It was a horrific experience. Uh, and I, I detail it in a video I have up on YouTube called, I think it's uh, my first sale or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that was a really terrible experience, I have to be honest. Um, you still have the boat, right? I, that boat is still in Sardinia. I, I did sail it now around Sardinia. So uh, there was another trip, I think, last last summer. So I got it I got a working, got it fixed. And then me and two Italian friends of mine, we took it. And it was a, the best sail I ever did. It was like a week long, just took it around the coast. These guys were absolute heroes. They're, they're fellow adventurers. One guy, he... Um, you know, he t- bought a bike and went all across Asia. Um, they're all they're always they're like digital nomad types. They're all around the world having adventures. Cool guys, mm-hmm. very cool guys. And they just they knew about me through my Instagram, my blog, and stuff. So they were readers of mine, I believe. Um, and uh, that's how they got in contact. But uh, very cool. But um, yeah, anyway, so after that trip, eventually bought the boat in the Caribbean in Grenada, and that uh, thus began my trip earlier in January where I wanted to do all the Lesser Antilles because it's the only countries I haven't been to in the Caribbean, mm-hmm. which is the, the island chain, the kind of uh, eastern island chain of the Caribbean, um, which encompasses around, I believe it's eight countries and uh, 13 territories. And that was a really... And before before we get into the yeah. Caribbean uh, sailing trip, because that's absolutely epic and I want to spend a lot of time on that, I want to set the stage a little bit. So you bought your first boat in Marseille. Uh, at this point you had done, you know, a little sailing course in New York and then a, another short one in Malta. Um, did you do it at the, uh, Royal Malta Yacht Club? No, okay. it was a, a pro sailing Malta. Pro sailing Malta. Yeah. And yeah. that was also like relatively short. How many times had you actually gone sailing prior to saying, I'm going to go across the Mediterranean? Well, that was my first offshore sail. <laughs> Uh, so, and I never liked doing night sailing or it was just, uh, literally a week's worth of, uh, of course. And, um, don't you think you should have prepared a little more? Well, I had, you see, I bought my instructor with me. He's a young guy, Italian okay. guy. He's only 25, but, uh, he, he's a water baby. You know, he's been sailing since he was young and he was kind of shocked when he saw the boat. He's like, Oh my God, we're going to take this thing across. If it was any other sailor that was older, they would have said, hell no. Cause it was a little 27 footer. Had to buy, mm-hmm. he, he made me he made me do a few things though he made me buy a life raft obviously because um so the weather was brutal at the end of uh end of october um early november in the mediterranean we hit it was just the weather was so bad and it, you know life jackets make sure everything we had this boat i the two boats i got um one thing i did was pick solid sound boats there's a class of boats that were built in the the late uh 60s to early 80s um called classic plastics they were made a lot thicker than the modern counterparts because they were the first fiberglass boats and they didn't know how thick to make them. So they made them super thick and they have these big, long keels, these big, long bottoms. So they're very, very sturdy. And there was about uh, 40, 50 models that were built called pocket cruisers, which could cross oceans at that size. Uh, modern boats of that, si- of, of that size, let's say 27 to 35 foot, would be a lot more flimsy and, and nec- mm-hmm. could, wouldn't be necessarily suited for ocean crossing. So I, I, I invested in good, strong, old keel boats. Now, the problem with that is all boats, all problems, the rigging, old sails, old uh, engines, the electronics. And that's mm-hmm. what led to a lot of issues on, on, on trips. Um, so the engine fire was, was, uh, was obviously because it was just, just old wiring and, uh, so yeah, and, and on my Caribbean trip, I you wouldn't believe the amount of trauma and incidents that occurred. It was absolute disaster, if I'm being frank. Mm. Yeah, um, I watched the uh, the video you just posted a couple of days ago uh, to prepare for this uh, conversation. So I watched the ten minute video and saw you uh, doing a lot of re- doing a lot of tinkering on the boat. Yeah, well, wait till you see what happens in future episodes because I, 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 I basically ran the whole gambit of things that could, could go wrong, did go wrong. Uh, I, I talked to other sailors on the trip, you know, because um, I was meeting, meeting sailors all the time. And I had more trouble than any of them had had in 50, 60 years in, the, in that trip. Um, partly because, because you bought a boat in the Caribbean that was like abandoned. Or... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was in a Nicholson 32. Um, yeah, I mean, so it was uh, it was an old boat, 1969. 
Um, big, huge keel on it, though. So, like, the, the body of it was a monster. I mean, when I took it out of the water, I had to get it fixed at one point. The, mm-hmm. the bottom of it, even though the boat was smaller than any of the boats in the other, in the marina, there was a lot, everyone has 40, 50 footer boats. The bottom of this thing was absolutely massive. Um, big, thick, long keel on it. Uh, you could you could take these things to Antarctica, you know. And I, I'm realizing now that the phrase even keel must come from boating. Oh, there's so many terms. When you start boating, you realize that so much of the English language uh, is derived from sailing terms. Uh, you know, give it a little leeway, uh, things like that. You know, uh, uh, there's there's loads of little uh, nuggets, and it's a whole language sailing. Mm-hmm. Um, there's all sorts of. Um, all yeah, sorts I've been I've been trying to get into it uh, this past summer. I think part partly you inspired me as well. I think you inspired Jake Nomada as well, and the two of us are really thinking about in the future um, doing something similar to what you're doing. And so that's part of where my questioning comes from is that. Uh, this is something that I think every man wants to do at some point is is learn how to sail and and master the seas and stuff. And so you've you've already done it to some extent. You've been doing uh, you know cross Mediterranean and cross Caribbean sailing trips. And so we're all trying to glean uh, pieces of advice and inspiration from it. Yeah, well, I think the sea mastered me more so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, I, I I can tell you a couple of things that happened. Um, the I mean, do you want to go into that now or is there any other back or any? Other? No, that I think um, uh, before the mishaps, maybe just explain uh, again to the audience what your plan was uh, originally. So my plan. Um, so so this region I'm talking about, uh, you guys maybe can pull it up on a map, the Lesser Antilles. It's from uh, from Venezuela to Puerto Rico, these chain of islands. And um, I it was the last countries I'd yet to visit in the Caribbean. So kind of, I have an overall arching goal of visiting every country in the world. Um, I don't take it as seriously as I used to, but it's still, it's nested in my, my life goals, I suppose. Uh, and this is the best place in the world to kind of visit by, uh, or explore by sea because all the islands are no more than a day sail away. Mm-hmm. And uh, with the constant trade winds um, going from east to west, and you're going up and down, uh, which is ideal uh, to go um, basically um, perpendicular to the wind. That's kind of like ideal sailing conditions. Um, and uh, so, so it was the perfect place to sail. Uh, now, I was under the impression that it was the perfect place to sail as a beginner, but uh, that was not the case. Uh, in fact, I was diving in the deep end really because um, the weather just kind of blew my mind a bit, uh, especially... Do, do you think you did it in the wrong season? Uh, no, because the, this hurricane season is between, I think, uh, July and um, n- the end of October. Mm-hmm. Um, that's all. Now, apparently the sailing is wonderful, but the risk of hurricanes, that's kind of, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, right. that's a no-go. So the best time, I'm assuming, is kind of uh, December to April. Yeah, especially after January, like February, March, April, because I noticed this closer got to summer, the more it calmed down, the seas calmed down, the wind calmed down. Uh, December and January, you get this thing called the Christmas winds, which, by the way, I was not aware of this phenomenon. And it's the, the, the there's actually really, really strong weather. So when I first, like my first two, three weeks, the weather was absolutely brutal. We were getting, you know, big, you know, two meter waves and you know, up to, you can get up to 25, 30 knots and uh, it got really dicey. And so I, I think at some point uh, I was hitting three meter waves and um, three meter waves are uh, going up to Antigua. And these are big seas. It doesn't sound like much, but uh, they they feel massive uh, on, on a tiny boat like that. There, It's very intimidating. Um, right. Because the boat's only so tall. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my... The, those boats, those classic plastics, the water line is quite low to the water. So you mm-hmm. get a lot of spray. We're getting whole waves just coming over the side and just drowning me. Mm-hmm. Uh, or drowning us, should I say. Um, and uh, we had the unfortunate... Uh, I said that this goes into the the bad things that happened. We had a, a fortunate series of events where I, I called abandoned ship twice, uh, believe it or not, and because of... of uh, we were, and we were sinking at one point. So... Um, <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, those, uh, th- th- this goes into my series of bad things that happen. I, I, I have so many, so many things. Sure, go for it. Go for it. Straight um, thought. So, okay. So the I guess the first thing that, that kind of uh, happened, which I thought was a nothing thing, but the thing is every small thing on a boat that you do wrong can lead to a catastrophe down the line. That's what I learned. I learned a lot. Uh, I didn't know anything about engines uh, or rigging when I started the trip. And I had to learn fast because uh, we ran into all sorts of trouble. But one small thing, you would think this is the most harmless thing in the world. I I never fished before, right? And I said, okay, I'll, I'll try some line fishing, which is basically without a rod, you throw out a, a line and have a lure on it. Uh, and I threw out this fish, the very first sail I did, right? So, so um, my parents came for the first uh, month of the trip, right? I got them to do a competent crew course, which is like a week long course, but it's not as advanced as day sailor, just so they can help out. So we come out of the, we finally get the boat ready. There's all sorts of things wrong with it, but uh, it took about two weeks to get it sorted. Uh, come out and just for about just a few nautical miles, when we were rounding the island, uh, we hit the Atlantic for the first time. It was really, really rough. I got kind of a big fright, uh, but it was only for a couple of miles. So we rounded the island and we hit the Caribbean side where it's calm. You're sheltered mm-hmm. from the, the sea. Mm-hmm. so it was a calm day we were going pretty slow because the bottom of the boat was uh had basically a jungle on it there was like lice and snails and, and crabs and it was just filthy all these barnacles and i i cleaned the i cleaned the propeller but um i just i couldn't clean the whole boat because it was just too much work i was going to get it done professionally along in, in the next place anyway and also you know we're getting used to the boat we were going slower than I expected. I expected to go to the next island uh, in the, that day, uh, Kariku, but it didn't make it. I had to stop halfway up Grenada. Um, so anyway, uh, I put out this fishing line because things are going pretty smooth when we round the island. Uh, didn't think anything of it. Realized we had to stop early because we we're going too slow. Um, never. Now I'd never. I sorry. I'd anchored a boat. I'd practice anchoring. Um, in Sardinia with the Italian guys. One of the Italian guys I was with, he was a more experienced sailor um, than me. And this was the first time me captaining a, a boat. So anyway. Yeah, just you that, and your parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they, they didn't really have a clue. They knew the basics, but um, they'd never been on a sailing boat uh, like up till two weeks prior. Um, anyway, so managed to get the anchor down, first time attempting it, and that was all fine. But one thing I forgot to do foolishly was to put the fishing line in pull the fishing line in after the sale i just le- i had left it out there now this led to a, a, f- a series of unfortunate events that actually nearly sank us let me explain so when i was reversing when we an- put down the anchor and you have to kind of reverse when you're anchoring so it gets a, t- a tug the fishing line wrapped around the propeller right very very fast and it, it fu- the, the speed of the RPMs, it fused with this thing called a cutlass bearing, which is the seal, the seal that connects the propeller to the engine room, mm-hmm. right? It wore away just like that. Like the rod. Yeah. And this wore away, this, this incident wore away the seal. So I, uh, I realized what had happened. I didn't, know, I didn't know there was a seal. I didn't know the autonomy of the, the boat. But I, I spent basically the whole... Uh, first afternoon then diving down and trying to cut off this uh this line uh, around the propeller and it was it was so uh fused that the plastic was basically in a giant block it was like it'd been forged in fire like it was like a giant block i had to kind of carve off with a knife um anyway i got it off then and the next sale it was only we, we were going to carry a coup. we we uh we were going past a place called kickham jenny it's an underwater volcano and that was seriously rough because there's a shelf there and it kicked up a massive sea. Got a, the shock of my life uh, with the sea there. And um, my parents were scared to bits. But uh, I noticed the when we arrived in Karaku that we, I opened the bills, which was the bottom of the, um, the, bottom of the boat, and it was filled with water. Uh, now, it hadn't come up to the floorboards yet, but it was filled with water. And I was like, what the, what the hell? So I, I run the bilge pump. Uh, and I thought, okay, I knew, th- I thought the boat was a bit leaky or maybe there was a hole or something. Um, anyway, fast forward to, uh, fast forward to, we are going up the Grenadines and, um, oh God, there was so much stuff that, the other stuff that happened. 
uh, along the way. I'm just thinking, but uh, basically, at one point, um, the seal had completely broken. I think I think we were on our way to uh, Beckway in um, the, the Grenadines, and th- literally we had water coming up through the the floorboards. This is the first time we started sinking. By the way, this was the good time. Um, and managed. What I realized was when the motor was running, when that propeller was spinning, all there was water coming in through the to the shaft and filling mm-hmm. up the engine room and going into the bilge pump because the seal was broken. So basically, I got told in Beckway, but I, I got I got a guy to go down and look at they these guys. They cleaned the bottom of the boat, and they told me about the seal. So before I thought uh, it was a hole, okay. So I, on the previous islands, I I was going down diving, and I was plugging holes, which are actually the runoff holes from the the boat. They weren't actual holes. I thought they were holes because I thought there was a hole in the boat. So I found it was this seal, and there was nowhere on the island to get it fixed. On, on Beckway or St. Vincent, the country of St. Vincent, because mm-hmm. they didn't have a boat yard. So basically, uh, I'd have to risk going all the way to St. Lucia, which was a uh, two day sail. But the guy at the boat yard in Beckway he said, This boat is not seaworthy. Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't risk it, but I had to risk it. Um, <laughs> but it gets worse, right? So, um, <laughs> So we so basically my plan was to every couple of hours run the bilge pump and just basically empty the boat with water so it like just kept uh, em- emptying the uh, running the bilge pump so it is spit spit out the water that was coming into the boat and just try and sail as much as possible. This wasn't possible on the lee side of Saint Lucia because we, we the wind died and we had to run the motor so we just kept running the bilge pump and hoping that it didn't fail on us. And uh, th- it kept getting worse and worse. It went from basically we'd run the bilge pump, maybe 30 seconds, all the water would be gone to like, you know, a minute, two minutes, three minutes. And we just keep spitting water nonstop for three minutes because we're taking on so much water. Then we hit in Lucia, uh, Lucia, should I say. And uh, that's when another. You made it. No, no, we didn't. We didn't at all because uh, that's when another tragedy befell. Uh, it's when uh, ran aground. So I crashed the boat into rocks. Whoa. Yeah, and this was a completely separate fucking thing that happened. <laughs> so, they, like, so what happened was uh, we we're coming in to get a mooring. This, <laughs> this is hilarious. This is not hilarious at all. But uh, <laughs> we we're coming into a mooring, and the mooring was very close to the shore. And uh, there was these guys trying to help us out. Um, uh, these island boys who were on a small boat trying to help mm-hmm. us with the mooring, and I was coming up to the mooring. And they were like, okay, I, I put it in neutral. And they're like, slow down. So slow down. Okay, I'm going to put it in reverse. Put the boat in reverse. We start speeding up. And I was like, what the hell? What's going on? And I thought maybe I was crazy or, or panicked in the moment. So I said, okay, I must be in forward, not reverse, because it's one side of the lever or the other, right? And I pushed it the opposite direction. We started speeding up even faster. And I'm like, oh no, this is definitely forward. This one, I was right the first time. And by the way, we're getting closer and closer to the shore. And I'm like, I'm, I'm really getting panicky. Everyone's starting yelling and screaming, whoa, whoa, whoa. And so I put it in reverse again, full throttle, started speeding up even more. And we're, and just before now, I look at my mom, I look at my dad, I said, grab onto something. We're going to hit. And bang, s- the boat slid up into a rock, smashed into him. Um, now I'll tell you what happened after but what had happened was <laughs> this is a bit things that can go wrong about there was a metal wire that we used to lock up the dinghy that my father had casually thrown in the, the locker a locker right now in this locker there is the battery and there also is the where the where the lever the the, the basically the the chain that connects the levers to the the motor right so what had happened was the lever i was was uh was going back and forth with the thing that connects to the gear shifter in the engine that had been fried and caught fire because the metal cable that i put in one side just happened to have touch off the battery and the other side so one part of the cable also found its way to that cable. They're both metallic. And this caused electrical fire. 
for the chances. Yeah, exactly. So the gear shifter cable wasn't working, so we're getting the revs and the power, but the gear shifter wasn't changing, so we're constantly going forward. Um, and this this cable had caused, us, it caused me trouble like two weeks earlier when I started the boat. When I started the boat, we couldn't get that gear shifter working, but uh, anyway, that's irrelevant. But And this is what caused us to slam into the boat, and I tell you, that was terror that was absolute terror um because the first thing you're thinking is okay well i was already sinking but are we sinking are we extra sinking <laughs> are we sinking for are we got two holes now i i i uh i didn't know what was happening we're, we're on the rocks like it, the boat wasn't we're up on the rocks because uh we come up with some force but um and this is the, like the southern part of uh, this is the Saint middle Lucia? the middle part of Saint Lucia, right okay. by the pitons, the famous the famous pitons in this small town called Soufry. Um, okay. And so everyone, the 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 boat guys throw a lot of ropes. They they get another boat to come who's who is close by, and these two speed boats trying to pull us out from the rocks. Um, they managed to get us free and pull us around to the mooring, tied up. Made sure we weren't sinking. The the I opened up the bilge and the water rise the water level wasn't rising. So okay, and then the guys basically came on the boat and robbed us. because uh, they were saying, "Oh, you should pay, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars for a rescue. That's how much you should pay." And they basically went through our stuff and basically took all our money and left. <laughs> um, it was not a nice experience. Uh, not a nice introduction to Saint Lucia. Um, now, like it wasn't a violent mugging or nothing. It was just like a very heated argument, and they were, they were insisting, you know, or we'll bring it to an ATM. We just kind of gave them like a hundred, two hundred bottles. Like, Here, listen, man, get lost. You know, they were very aggressive, but anyway, they got lost. So, um, from there, managed to get up to Rodney Bay, which was the uh, kind of the main yachting hub. Got the boat taken out of the water. Man, you know, got the the seal fixed. And got the, the the bottom done. That was the first time. That was the first problem. That. Uh, and how did you even get the boat up the coast even more if it was like crashed into rocks? Well, the thing is, I dived down, and because that those boats they're so thick, um, they're five inches of fiberglass. What had happened was, it, I was very lucky because what happened, it slid in between two rocks, so it kind of got wedged in. So when mm. I it up the boat, it it was like basically just a scratch on it. It was uh, these kind of a, a little two scratches along the side but there was no puncture point or it was there was no blunt force and we were actually able to get it uh, epoxied and fixed um pretty handy because because but if that had happened it, you know, it was it there was of course the, the scrape dug out some fiberglass but if that was on a modern beneteau or a modern boat which is two inches thick it would have sank it for sure but those mm. are so robust um that you know you'd have you'd have to hit a goddamn iceberg to sink to sink those uh, those classic plastics but um, the, it was much worse, though, the second time we started sinking. Um, so uh, that was off the coast of Guadeloupe. Uh, the, the shaft, the... the, the... Wait, wait, and that's way forward. So oh, yeah. you're in St. Lucia. I'm, I'm yeah. looking at a map right now. So you got yeah. the thing repaired. You made it to Martinique, and then you made it to Dominica, and then uh, on to Guadeloupe. Yeah, so it was all that was going pretty. That was a pretty good period because uh, we were in Carnival in Martinique, so that was blast. Um, yeah, that was. But Martinique was a good time because it was just a, a decent. And then we didn't stop. I didn't stop in Dominica till the way back down, basically, because I kind of did a loop. Um, uh, I kind of yeah. So so to geography wise, it started in Grenade at the bottom, went all the way up to Saint Martin on the top. And then I ended the boat. The end of the boat ended up back down in Guadeloupe, and I, I kind of flew to Dominica for the end of the trip. But that, anyway, there's a different mm-hmm. skipping ahead. But um, so and it was we had we had some good sailing days. Uh, we hit some squalls, I think, from Saint Lucia to Martinique, which is just really really bad weather. It was like a cloud of uh, a cloud of just a giant. Imagine a gray wall coming towards you, and just got pummeled um, and ripped ripped the mainsail. Um, so I may, and so basically I had to take the mainsail down. Oh, sorry. Uh, before all this, by the way, also what happened in Beckway, uh, uh, this is way back in St. Grenadines, the, the, my front sail ripped in half because uh, it got caught in the mast. Uh, so I had to replace the front sail. And then on that trip, the, the mainsail ripped. So I had to replace the mainsail. 
this is all very expensive, by the way. This is the most expensive trip of my life. Uh, getting it taken out of the water, uh, doing all that work on the uh, and all the sales. Oh my god! I, I oof, thank God. Is it, I, is it typically like cheap uh, to repair a boat and stuff in the in, in these Caribbean islands, or is it more expensive than it would have been in Europe? It's sama sama. I think it's same same. It's in, in, in a lot of instances, it's actually more expensive. Um, think labor is a bit cheaper, but not by much. To be honest, in fact, a lot of um, like marinas are much more expensive in the Caribbean. Uh, like for the docking and stuff. Yeah, because there's, no, there's not a lot of infrastructure. So, like for example, between Grenada and uh, Saint Lucia, like the whole island, even though Saint Vincent and the Grenadines is the most popular place in the world to sail, there's actually no place to take your boat out there. There's no facilities. Oh, I think there is a small little place in Saint Vincent, but it's it has a really bad reputation, um, and it's also a lot of crime on Saint Vincent and that kind of thing. But um, uh, anyway, um, so apart from all the sales ripping and all that kind of thing, Guadeloupe, the worst was was definitely the worst uh, I experienced was because uh, we hit some really, really bad weather. And well, I, I hear my mom from down this they this was their last bit of the, they got the worst of it because this is, they were going home from Guadeloupe when I was getting new crew. Um, my brother was with me. One of my brothers also was there for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, he was there for a few incidents as well, which I have to go back to. But um, actually, I'll go back to it now. Sorry if I'm just skipping around, but I keep Sorry. remembering bad things that happened. Another thing that almost happened was uh, uh, when, when I mentioned about the fishing line, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, getting caught in the propeller. Well, one because well, I was such a newbie, right? Well, one time we were in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, we were in a place called Carrick or um, what's it called? I can't, I can't remember the island now. It's uh, what's it called? Uh, it's one second. I'll get it up here now. It is called, yeah, Canawan, Canawan. Mm-hmm. And go, going to grab a mooring ball. Um, and we, we had a line in the water, a rope in the water, just it had gotten loose. It jammed up the propeller, killed the engine, all right? So we had no engine and the sails were down and we're right by the coast. And we started to drift towards the coast. And like, this is the first time that the threat of running aground happened. Because um, you're just not as, as aware as you should be when you first started sailing. You don't, you don't realize how dangerous a rope in the water can be. Uh, so we started to drift towards... And the weather was a bit rough as well. And it was, a, it was a, the worst, one of the worst anchorages we stayed in. So we're getting pushed towards land. I was like, oh my God, we're going to run aground. Because we have no control of the boat whatsoever. And basically what I had to do was... I grabbed the longest rope I could and I screamed at my brother and my dad. It's like, tie this to somewhere in the boat. And I jumped in the water. I swam as hard as I could to the nearest mooring ball. And, the, and I swear to God, it was a body length away. The rope ran out. I couldn't reach, I couldn't reach it to tie it and to secure the boat. And, and it was drifting, drifting. And what they did was I screamed over, like, tie the rope to another rope, you know. So they were fumbling and fumbling, getting closer to the shore. They managed to tie it. And I, I just had, they just gave me just enough rope to wrap around the other side of the mooring ball. I tied, tied a knot in it and it, and it just tugged on it, like I'd say 10 seconds later. So the, the, it stopped the boat uh, running aground. And then we were able to pull the boat back to the mooring ball. So that was just another little, little tiny thing that happened. But, uh, <laughs> but a potentially okay. horribly Ropes dangerous. In the water. Got it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I, off Guadeloupe, the worst was the, the seal on the inside of the boat failed so this is a huge seal this is a, it's called a stuffing box um and this is inside the engine room and because because uh it was such an old piece of equipment should have been replaced years ago and i didn't even know what a stuffing box was and listen when this thing failed there was a deluge of water like so much water coming into the boat that pumping it out with the bilge pump it, you you couldn't pump it out so it, 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 at the rate you needed to to stop the boat from sinking. And I didn't realize this had happened. So this had popped. The bottom was the, the engine room was filling up, filling up the bilge. And I'm there sailing the ship with my dad outside. And my mom goes, eh, Mar- Mark, Mar- Mark, it there's there's water, there's water uh, on the floor. There's there's loads of water in the floor. Is is that normal? You know? <laughs> and I look down and I see this the water, the water was coming up through the floorboard, sinking the ship. And we're in this big, heavy weather, getting pummeled by waves. And I see this water coming up through the floorboards. 
I don't think I've ever been as scared in my life. I thought we're we're done for. Um, we were about, I would say, uh, an hour or two from the nearest piece of land in Guadeloupe. Nowhere near a bayer, but I thought, worst <laughs> comes to worst, we could get it into. I I I ran down. I said, Dad, point it towards land because if we can somehow bail enough water out of here. And an hour, even if we run aground into land, at least we can get to shallow water that we can bail or jump out of the boat or something. I don't know. Just get towards the land is, uh, or hit something. I don't care, but just get to something we can, some sort of land. And I open up the engine room and I see this torrent of water coming in. Uh, and it was just, I froze. It was just terror. Um, so uh, I, and this is this is where it gets worse. I turn on the bilge pump so it can start to empty the water and the bilge pump failed. It had worked the whole trip and at this point, the bilge pump failed. And the bilge pump is just a, a water it's, pump for the yeah, engine it, room? or Yeah, no, it, it's in the bottom of the boat and it bails water. So when water comes okay. into the boat, it bails it out. So it's it's kind of like a mandatory thing after the boat. And also there's a backup called a manual bilge pump, which is a pump that you use with your hand, that failed. I never tested it. And obviously the pipe uh, that led to the, the exterior of the boat, there was obviously a valve somewhere that the pipe was, it wasn't working basically. It wasn't bailing water. So the, the bilge pump failed, the manual bilge pump failed, and we're taking on water so fast. The boat, I'd say, maybe 30 minutes before we sank it. Mm-hmm. Um, now, we did have a dinghy on top of the boat. So worst case, I could we could have jumped to the dinghy and an SOS from an EPIRP. Uh, but, you know, you're not thinking of that. You're thinking... And the thing is, the, the waves are so big that even if we had gotten the dinghy, we would have been smashed. Like, we, we would have ended... Our bodies would have ended up with the water. It would have been a, just a bad time. <laughs> potentially deadly. I'm not going to lie. It potentially deadly. Um, and thank, thank the Lord, or whatever your God is, um that we were running we see we're running the motor and uh we we're motor sailing because uh we were going against the wind and we needed to uh we 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 needed an extra push to get to Guadeloupe and we wanted to get through the bad weather and when I turn I so the first thing I thought was like okay I'm gonna turn off the engine uh turn off the engine because what if the same thing happened if the repeller stops running maybe the it'll reduce the water flow like it did previously when the seal broke from the outside and when I when I stopped the engine, the deluge turned into just like a stream, you know, like a manageable stream of water where I knew that I could get a bucket and bail water quicker than the water was coming in at that point. Mm-hmm. So started bailing, started getting the, and the thing was, uh, there was a lot of, I had a bit of a, an oil leak from the engine. So there was oil mixed um, with the water. And so it was making all the boats slippy, slip all over the place trying to organize things. So I got like a cooking pan. I started bailing water into the fridge, uh, sorry, into the sink and pumping it out. Started pumping out as quick as I could, buckets, everything. Uh, and I said, listen, the only way this is going to work uh, is if uh, I get my dad to do it and does it to the toilet. He basically starts bailing water into the toilet, um, pumping it out. And I sail to the nearest safety point. Um, and that, that's, and then it was basically like, that's what we did for uh, two hours. We were two hours, but I was, I was sailing, uh, up on top and my dad was bailing water and managed to stop, like basically get, get the water level slowly, slowly down. And, um, I, we had, uh, we know we had, we couldn't run the motor because the motor was causing too much water to come in. So I had to basically go into an anchorage under sail with absolutely no motor power and maneuver the boat to anchor under sail, which is a very, very difficult maneuver for anyone who knows how to sail when, when you don't have a motor and you have to come into an anchorage to anchor with sail. It's dangerous and extremely difficult. Uh, never done it before, but managed to pull it off. Managed to pull it off in the ca- in the main city of, of Guadeloupe in, in Porto Prite. And that was their last sale that they did with me it was a, try, a bad way to end it for them um but they basically had to fly home and 
when they left, was that, I thought, was that always their intended departure point, or were they, or were they just like enough? <laughs> uh, no, they had inte- like I, my brother had it. My brother was supposed to go for two weeks. Uh, he he just had the experience going to the St. Vincent the Grenadines, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm done." <laughs> uh, uh, he didn't go to St. Lucia. He might have gone to St. Lucia, but I don't think he was loving it because the conditions were just too bad. He he, my brother had never sailed before my first this is i have two brothers this is my second one and he he kind of was like what the hell is going on here uh, he didn't expect the weather to be as bad and the sleeping conditions were terrible because it was a lot of wind and chop and so he couldn't he could never sleep and it was too hot and he was like i'm not loving this i'm gonna i'm gonna skip the saint lucia bit so he he headed back uh, after a week but um i said it's not it, 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 i can understand why he did it like he wasn't he wasn't loving it uh, but he said he wasn't sleeping anyway um but I think he had other reasons to go home. It wasn't just that. Anyway, the yeah, it was. They had basically plans to do a month. And as far as, far as up as they got, they would fly home. Because I know I didn't know if they could end. Uh, at the start, I thought they'd be flying home from Grenada because we couldn't get the boat started. Uh, and I thought the trip then, when we had the first break uh, seal in St. Vincent, I thought we'd be go- going home then because the guy told me, don't sail, it's not seaworthy. Then we crashed in St. Lucia. I thought, hey, th- we're definitely going home now. <laughs> And then, but then you know, they ripped both the sails. But we got to Guadeloupe anyway, and they booked the. They got me up pretty high. Fair play to them. I mean, they were great. Like my my mom, uh, I was really surprised her. She, seriously brave woman. I don't know any other woman who would have tolerated those uh, those conditions and, and stayed uh, on board the ship. So fair play to her. And my dad was incredible as well. It was the first time I ever saw my dad panicky or, or where he was always a very calm dude but he was completely out of his uh, depth i've never seen seen him be like that <laughs> <laughs> they both had their boat trauma and they left the boat traumatized <laughs> but as they say it was the biggest adventure of life and they actually look back on the whole thing really really fondly because of all the because um, i'm not telling you all the bad things but there was so much incredible moments like the sunsets the you know the, like the the rum punches on the beach these beautiful locations the people we met Oh my god, it was it was it was rich with just incredible experiences. Um, I might have if I had left it there, and because I thought it was definitely ending in Guadeloupe. After that one, I thought it was definitely flying home. Actually, I put it for sale after that incident with the stuffing box. I, I was done. I put it for sale at that point. Managed to get it fixed in the end, but uh, and I, I continued my journey. Um, but uh, I was done at that point. I was my soul was <laughs> wrecked, tattered. But there was so much worse to come. Uh, <laughs> oh god it, it, it was worse believe it or not there was worse that came afterwards um, but sinking wise I think it, maybe maybe not as bad as sinking but um, although there was one point where the, we're stepping on the end anyway sorry I'm skipping ahead I was just so much to tell I was so much to tell this is the first time I'm telling all these stories so when you're entering all these countries is it the same as entering in an airport where like there's custom there's a customs officer at the port or do you have when you when you I guess pull up in a new country? Do you have to then uh, get onto land and report to some sort of immigrations office, or how Bingo. do you like formally enter the country? Yeah, so basically, I may or may not have entered a couple of few countries illegally because it was during COVID and I didn't want to fucking get <laughs> tests or uh, uh, I, I I did a lot of dodgy stuff on the trip, uh, which I shouldn't go into detail on this podcast. But there was a yeah, it was a bit of. There was a bit of uh, hanky panky going on. Uh, I, I could tell. I, I wouldn't tell the. I was not going to incriminate myself. No, that's but, um, fine. But how would it, how would it normally work? Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. You, you could. You could. We only got checked. We only got boarded by customs once on the whole trip, and that was in. Uh, you could. You could. Uh, I can see why p- drug smugglers use boats because you can just go from country to country and not check in anywhere. It's so easy. Um, like even around Europe and stuff, you can just go from port to port and never talk to anybody. Uh, there's no checks, but uh, you, what you're supposed to do is you arrive, you, you report to customs and immigration, and yeah, that's the kind of procedure. And it was very complicated with the COVID stuff, uh, but there was, mm. let's just say I found ways around that. I'm good at Photoshop. Is, is there but, uh, typically <laughs> like a Coast Guard immigration, or you have to go to like the real the real one? There's a uh, usually two. There's customs and then there's immigration. So there's okay. usually two options. Customs is where you deal with both. You, it's like an office you go into. You you know usually you have to radio them beforehand, but in the Caribbean no one answers the radio, so uh, <laughs> you just kind of show up, and it's all very casual. Um, have you learned how to work the radio and do the commands and all that? 
ah, no, you don't really have to know much about it. It's like you just say your boat over, over. You learn the basics of a mayday, but it's it's okay. nothing. You know what's really cool uh, about boats? There's so much. I mean, it's a whole different world, man. It really is. They have this thing called a cruiser's net. So, like, you wake up in Grenada at 7.30 every morning. You turn on the cruiser's net. And it's like an, like the internet before the internet. So, it's like, oh, good morning, cruisers. Today is this date. And the weather's going to be like this. Now, next is social events. Any uh, social events out there? And then the bars will call in. And they'll be like, yes, today we're doing Taco Tuesdays or whatever. There's an open mic at this place. And then, uh, awesome. right, next is Treasures of the Bilge and different boats will like say what they're selling from the boat or they welcome new arrivals, departures. And it's like a whole network that happens in the morning on these, on these. Uh, That's on, awesome. I really so want to cool. come back to this. After we finish the mishaps, I want to come back to the, the, the fun, how, cool parts, how, how, how boating is like a whole new world. Oh yeah. Um, but, it's so cool. but yeah. Um, yeah. If you want to uh, keep going, tell us, uh, I get the tragedy uh, over the rest of it. Yeah, sure. I get to the good parts. Yeah. So anyway, Guadalupe, I, I put out an Instagram and Twitter. So if I needed crew, it was actually really cool about having the obviously I, I, I my reputation is not what it used to be because I I'm not very active anymore but I, I still was able to catch a few uh, crew members just by putting it out on social media. Had a guy fly down from New York, uh, Hunter his name is he, within like two days. This kind of he's kind of a w- wealthy chap, uh, older player type of dude. Um, flew down. He not he said he knew a bit about sailing, not as much as he said, but. <laughs> Uh, which which proved uh, I I don't wanna, I like I I love the guy um but let's just say he he ended up uh, having a few personal problems on the way with dealing with alcoholism he he'd given up alcohol for he was in Betty Ford clinic for a while and I was a bad influence and this led to a series of disasters uh, on the boat um first being uh so first of all we we managed to get up from Guadeloupe to Antigua now that trip was the worst waves that I'd experienced on the trip. This is where we're hitting the three meter waves. Mm-hmm. He was a very affluent dude. Um, when he told me he had sailing experience, he basically spent like a week on a catamaran with his rich buddies, right? Uh, he was not expecting to get smashed by the Atlantic in this little shitty old 32 <laughs> footer boat. So he he was kind of left shooken after this passage that we did and during this passage uh, we befell a disaster another disaster of course a different type of one but a very nasty one which was we hit we, we hit the squall so there's a massive uh, this this gray wall coming towards us as that's how you know a squall's coming so it's like okay reduce sail we're gonna get smashed we got smashed and it got smashed hard so much so that i uh, look up and the um, the basic, oh, what do you call them? I can't remember the name of them. But the the things that, uh, the little um, things that connect the mainsail to the mast. There's a, I don't know why I can't remember the name of them. But um, okay. these little clips, basically. These plastic clips, they're quite strong. But um, I noticed one snap, snap from, the, from the, the force of the wind. And we're keeling, we're right over the side. Even with reduced sail, it, we're getting... It's just too much wind. Snap. Another one snaps. I'm like, oh, God. And they weren't together, but there's one up and one down. Snap. Another one. And this one is right beside the other one snaps. And I look up and I said, oh, good God. If one snaps either side of those, because we had two snapped in a row, the sail's gone. And as quickly as I had that thought, I said, I, I told uh, Hunter, I said, grab, grab the... Um, Grab, grab the steering wheel. And literally, as I was just getting up as a cock pin, snap, 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 snap. Lost the mainsail into the ocean. Like and the mass too or just the sail? No, no, just the sail. So I jump up and uh, now, now the, the bottom bit of the sail is still connected to the boom, which is, a, is it's the bottom part of the of the, the kind of the mast, I guess you could call it. It holds down the mainsail. But but it, it flew, the whole mainsail went into the ocean. And I dive across and in all these waves, getting pummeled by just spray and stuff, I pull in the sail from the, from the ocean. Uh, managed to save it. Uh, and we had to basically, uh, it, it took a lot longer than we expected, but we spent, the, it was a good, a long, long day sail. I think like 14 hours or something maybe 13 hours uh, but we had to just sail on the um the front sail then 
uh, it, that that was that was kind of a nasty experience. Um, but the uh, <laughs> so anyway, he was supposed to join me up to St. Martin, but after that trip, he was done. Uh, he was done for that pass. He helped me go around the island uh, to the next stop. But what happened was after that sail, he. I, you know, we ha- he needed a beer. He said, oh, well, I, I offered it to him, in fairness. But then he tells me about the whole doesn't drink thing. And he said, I said, why don't you drink? He said, well, I kind of spiral out of control when I drink. And it goes on for days. And I said, okay, maybe I shouldn't give him that beer. And uh, so Hunter, if you listen, I'm sorry I'm telling this story, but it's hilarious. Um, it's not hilarious for you, but... Uh, <laughs> but but anyway, he 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 starts the next day, you know, we're walking around the place called English Harbor in Antigua. Lovely place, mm-hmm. beautiful place. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, just walk around the next day after that beer. And he he goes and uh he goes in the farms, he comes back, oh, breakfast beers on the street. I'm like, okay, all right, breakfast beers, why not? And he he these breakfast beers last all day. He's drinking, drinking, drinking now. He's drink, <laughs> drinking nonstop. So come say we're we're sailing around to the other side of the island to get ready to cross to St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, a place called Jolly Harbour. Now, this, this, that, this sail caused another series of unfortunate events. So I guess he was drinking early. Uh, I didn't know this, but I asked him to pull up the anchor. And when he pulled up the anchor, the anchor smashed off this um, piece of metal up the front of the boat, which uh, basically feeds in the rope for the front sail, okay? I didn't know this had happened, but it, it misaligned it, right? So we're sailing around. It was a pretty handy sail until we get to uh, the capital, uh, St. John's. We're about, about 40 minutes an hour out. And I tried to bring in the front sail, but because the feeder line is not working because the metal is misaligned, uh, it's not coming in. I can't put in the uh, I can't pull in the the front sail, so I'm like, oh my god, crap! And it it was it was windy enough, so I I really had to roll it up manually by hand. So I listen, man, take control of the boat because we're in a we're in a narrow channel with a shipping lane, you know. So you, you need to concentrate, take control of the boat, try and get us in as far as you can. I'm gonna try to roll this up by hand. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that in the previous harbor we got new clips for the mainsail, so we had the mainsail reattached, right? Um, we had to we had to we had to fo- we had to go all over. Uh, the island to different places that would find these old clips because these clips were ancient because the boat was so old. So we just had just enough clips for the mainsail, literally just enough. And some of them were very uh, old and worn down, which causes problems later, but I'll get into that. Um, Anyway, so I'm trying to roll up this front sail by hand and it's extremely difficult. It takes me 40 minutes. My forearms are burning trying to do this because the wind is pushing against the... uh, the 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 sail and I'm fighting the wind. It was extremely excruciating. And I, after about 30, 40 minutes, I noticed that we've gone backwards. We're nowhere near the the sail. We're out in the out in the sea again. I'm like, what the hell, man? What are you doing? And I I come back to him. Um, and I was like, are you seasick? Are you, I thought he had COVID because he was looking weird. And I'm like, are you okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I said, what, what are you doing? And I looked at the, the GPS. We had zigzagged all over the place. We had just gone around in circles and it was all over the place. And I go downstairs and I see this nearly finished bottle of rum. So he had bought a bottle of rum in the morning and he was drinking the whole time. Down a fucking bottle of rum. <laughs> True sailor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this, this is what causes mess, you know. And uh, anyway, got into there. He was done. He, 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 the next day, he, he ordered a bottle of wine for breakfast and by lunchtime I found him buying fucking coke. <laughs> and he was doing coke with the ship by lunchtime. So he he spiraled completely out of control. Uh, and he realized it himself. So he basically had to check himself into a hotel and book a flight home and sort his life out. Because uh, I think he he's I think he was married as well. Uh, so uh, he, he just kind of he was home. Now listen, we had great times. I had great times with this guy, but he obviously had had an issue with that. Um, he had to fly home, and, and and on the docks there was this German, young German guy, who was looking for a ship to sail 
up north. He was trying to get to the Dominican Republic. And there's, a, there's a whole network, by the way, of, of uh, boat hitchhikers uh, on all these ports. Um, Let's definitely come back to that. Yeah, no, it's very cool. And this guy hitched across the Atlantic because apparently all, they all meet up in Portugal. And they and there's this kind of network that happens in the Grand Canaries, Portugal and Cape Verde of all these boats and young sailors that all kind of there's a big network of hitching lifts and they organize payments and all. It's a very interesting world. But um, so this guy is named Moritz. Shout out Moritz if you're listening. Cool guy. Um, and this is in St. John's, Antigua? Th- yes, this is in St. John's. Uh, Jolly, yeah. Jolly Harbor. Uh, sorry, Jolly Harbor. It's close to St. John's. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so he was my new crew member. And this is when, not the final thing that happened that was terrible, but it, we're, we're getting close to the end. Ugh, it's... <laughs> But it, oh, actually, no, wait, there's, there's a lot more. God damn. Uh, sorry, I know this is getting a bit long winded and stuff, but uh, it's exciting stuff. So anyway, we we crossed the St. Kitts and Nevis. Thought it was a grand day. Thought it was fine. Now, two things, two new issues that caused major issues. One, I had a really bad oil leak. I developed a really, really bad motor oil leak in the engine. The engine doesn't work without motor oil. This thing was got so bad that it was going through about uh, a quart of oil every half an hour. That's how bad it developed. But at this point, it was maybe a quart every two hours of the motor running, which is terrible. It was a bad oil leak. And it, it had gotten really bad at this point uh, where it was hard to ignore because I had to buy like eight, ten quarts just for a trip. And so I couldn't... I, I, had, to, I had to use the motor very sparingly. Um... Now, you know the, the way I was telling you that I had to roll up the front sail by hand? Mm-hmm. Okay. What, I didn't know how rigging works. What I didn't realize that when I did that, I had actually unscrewed the, the metal cable that connected the top, uh, uh, the, the sail from the top of the mast to the front of the boat. The thing that held, the actual cable that held the whole sail up. So I didn't realize this had happened, right? So we're about mm, three... Oh, God, I actually want to say... I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you. I think it was about five hours sail. It ended up being five hours from St. Kitts and Nevis. So we the whole day. Thought it was grand. We're going downwind. Great old day. And out of nowhere, there was a gust of wind. Bang! The whole front sail of the boat just gets taken away. Uh, the thing, this cable snapped. The so the 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 kind of the the metal rod that you slide the front sail into it snapped in three places. The ho- and the and the the cable snapped, and the whole thing fell into the ocean. I lost the force day. Jeez. Yeah. And the force day supports the mast. If you lose the force day. The back stay is useless. Or say, if you lose the force day, you lose support of the mast. So, managed to, I, by the way, I, I re, got retrieved it from the ocean because it was still, uh, it's still connected at the top of, from the, to the top of the, the, the mast. So, we got all the bits, all the rods and the sail in. It was very panicky. The thing is, the thing is, Moritz was like, oh my God, what is happening? But believe it or not, I actually wasn't that panicked about it. I was like, oh crap. Because so much stuff had happened to me at this point. I was like, oh, God, it's just another day sailing. Uh, so I just got to work and got it in and pulled it in. And I was actually kind of, it was panicky, but I was actually kind of calm about it because, like, listen, I've dealt with so much stuff sinking and stuff. This is minor. This, But then I then I realized, oh, God, that this supports the mast. What if the mast goes? Now, thankfully, we're going downwind. So if you can imagine the wind and the front sail was pushing the mast forward, but we still had the backstay, so we had tension on the backstay. So the backstay was keeping the sail up, the, the mast up. If if we had been going upwind, the mast would have snapped because we, it would have, we would have no we'd have nothing sub- supporting it basically. So okay. we had, we're down to a mainsail and we're five hours away, starting to get dark because we'd lost uh, sail power. We're slowed down, and I realized, okay, I have to use the engine. Beep, 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 beep. After, an, after half an hour, we're out of engine oil. Uh, 
I have a little tiny bit of engine oil that I know would be good for around 15, 20 minutes of engine time. So we are forced to, um, we had to find the nearest possible point we could sail, we could sail into uh, and just use the last 15 minutes to anchor with the motor, right? So we're there for five hours just staring at the mast, hoping it doesn't break, and then snap. Those, those replacements, uh, things we got, snap. Two snaps. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at losing the mainsail. So no mainsail, no motor oil to run the engine, no front sail. Absolute zero control of the boat. Right? Just a rudder. <laughs> just, a, just, just smash into Nevis eventually. Um, now, so we were there for five hours just staring at that goddamn mainsail, looking at those... Uh, Looking at those uh, those those clips, praying to whatever god we had that no more snaps because they weren't both together the two snaps they were they were one at the top and one at the bottom. Just praying like do not snap. It was the, such a tense five hours. Eventually, actually, we got around uh, the corner and uh, just had enough motor oil to uh, to kind of come into this little bay that no one else was anchored in, and we we're in the dark at this point. Uh, and I was kind of just going on GPS <laughs> when I anchored down when we anchored down when I dove down the next day we were I'd say not half a meter from the ground we, we'd we gone in so shallow that we oh god another 10 20 meters we would have ran aground oh anyway uh, and I should mention that we had intended to go to St. Martin uh, not St. Kitts uh, on this journey but we changed plans halfway through because of this issue so we were in St. Kitts now illegally because he didn't need, he needed a COVID test. He didn't need it for St. Martin's. We didn't have any COVID tests. So we were effectively stowaways there for a week. And we had to... Uh, listen, we got sore in the end. I don't want to incriminate myself too much, but it was a lot of... Uh, it was dicey. Let's just say it was dicey. Um, anyway... Oh, okay. God, I need I need a break from all this. Well, let's let's let's. Uh, I'll tell you about the next parts of the trip because I need to break okay. up all this because this is heavy for me. Even going back to this, there's a lot more that happened, but um, we're about three quarters. Just reliving away it in your head. <laughs> yeah, no, because it's a bit dramatic. Like I want to get into something a bit lighter because I feel like it's. Uh, let's. I'll go on to. I'll I'll stop and say Martin. So, um, got the got some repairs done anyway. Uh, managed to find clips. And got the went up to Stacia, which is amazing, by the way. This island, Stacia, is a Dutch colony. I got to St. Martin, and that's where Moritz left, and my brother, my other brother, joined. And that's a new series of unfortunate events. <laughs> um, and this would be your other brother? Yeah, my other brother. And that's and that was kind of like the last stint. We went to Guadeloupe. We had to go back to, to, to Nevis, then Montserrat and the, and Guadeloupe. But there's a lot there's a lot of things that happened on that journey as well that were, oh God, really, really dicey as well. Um a uh, totally different new set of problems but um we'll, we'll right, go to something so lighter for time for we need a pause we need a pause jesus we need a pause um <sighs> yeah so how <laughs> let you take your breath um how many new countries did you tick off uh on this trip so um i so the two awkward ones uh barbados and trinidad that were kind of not on the route uh i'd visited barbados when i bought the boat initially like back last september um mm -hmm. kind of just to get it i really liked barbados really cool play, place and um, best nightlife in the region cool beach is very flat though um and then also before i went to grenada on this trip i stopped off in trinidad uh, and kind had of had some fun yeah exactly I, I met a reader there as well he contacted me on instagram or his twitter actually he reached out to me, really, really cool guy. Um, kind of like he's a kind of he's 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 Trinidadian, but he's like blue eyes, but dreadlocks. So and he's a model, I believe. So he and he showed me like clubs and stuff. He he was a he was a perfect host. Um, really cool guy. Um, but yeah, and I had a blast in Trinidad. That was a real a nice kind of way to start things. So, um, question for you. So, why uh, start? That's your in question. Grenada? Eight countries. Eight, eight countries. That's answer. Eight question. countries. Yeah. Okay. Eight, countries, yeah. eight. Eight countries. That's 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 nice. And so you started in Grenada, which is kind of like the the southernmost of uh, you Antilles, know that line yeah. of Lesser Antilles countries. Yeah. Um, was there a particular reason that you started kind of at the south, going north versus north south? Was that like a, a question of the winds and the direction? It was a question of where I could buy the boat. I mean, there's there's two options. They're kind of there's a lot of boats in St. Martin's, uh, up the right or up the north, and also the British Virgin Islands. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're they're in the hurricane belt, where the further south you get, there's no, there's no hurricane. So it's, Grenada is the safest. Grenada and Trinidad is like the two safest place in the Caribbean mm-hmm. to keep your boat. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a big boating community there. It was easier to find. Uh, like Grenada is amazing. You have most people. Grenada is probably probably my favorite country in the region. Most of the people there on sailboats, they just don't move. They just park up there and they end up staying there for years. And they just kind of, there's such a cool boating scene there. Like you have open mics and they all bring their saxophones and stuff. They have different bars. You have all the old sailors that go jamming. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if you saw my video. This, I, my boat was right beside this abandoned island or this unhabitable island called Hog Island. It had a beach bar there, yep. barbecue, rastas. Uh, you just take your dinghy there. It's, it's just so cool. Like, right, it's just, uh, I love it. Um, so they just stay there. Um, so there's a big, it's a big hub, Grenada. And that's what, and that's where I found the boat, and it was perfect because I wanted to start either north or south. Now the disadvantage was like uh, my boat came with a free mooring as well, so I didn't have to pay for storage. Um, it, it, what I what does like, that mean? A mooring is a mooring like a parking spot? Or? Yeah, it's like a ball, and it's connected to chains and a sand screw. Now you got them get them replaced every year, but it basically is something you tie your boat onto, and it's kind of like a parking space. Okay, and, so it's 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 uh, the mooring is on land. No, and it's, it's like it's not. It's 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 that you're thinking of. There's there's different types of mooring. You can call a mooring like a, a mooring at a marina is still. A, it's kind of the different ones. There's a ball mooring which is out in open ocean. Mine was out in ocean. All the boats okay. are out in ocean. It wasn't in the marina. So marinas usually have to pay for. Um, okay, okay. So it's like a parking spot in an in the, in ocean, the ocean, but like in a but like in a bay. So protected it's kind of protected. bay. Yeah, it's yeah. Protected bay. And people typically pay like a like an annual fee for the moorings. Uh, there. N- some places, yes, but a lot of it's free for all. To be honest, especially in the Caribbean, you just okay. Put there so you only morning. pay if you're like really like on a dock. But if you're yeah. if you if you're just putting the anchor down, I guess in a mooring, you're anchor, it's, anchoring. It's no anchor free. anchoring is different. So anchoring is free everywhere usually. Uh, okay. You know, you just put down your anchor anywhere, but it's not secure. Moorings are much more secure because they're really robust uh, chains and stuff. Uh, and mm. a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, enterprising locals will put down moorings in popular spots, and then you pay twenty, thirty a night, twenty dollars, thirty a night to use the mooring. Uh, and sometimes, some places, the manato- uh, moorings are actually mandatory, like in the Fre- some of the French islands and stuff like that. Um, I rarely used marinas. There's not as much in the in the Caribbean. I think I used marina maybe twice. Yeah, twice, three times maybe. Twice, even, yeah, okay. um, uh, three times. Sorry, three. I, I, anyway, irrelevant. Uh, mostly, mostly anchoring, followed by mooring boys. Okay, gotcha. And um, let's talk a bit about like this whole different world of of boating and yachting, and um, I guess the community around it, and the things you learn, and just how I guess I don't know being on the water and being in a boat. It's just a very different dynamic or way to go through life versus going on land you're talking a bit about um you know the i guess the morning radio um so how did how like what is like the range on those radios is it just kind of everyone in a marina or in a little area no they're so the, these vhf radios there's different channels uh you, you i think the range on them is pretty big i mean people use these out in open ocean uh, actually i'm gonna just quick a quick you know it says you can about um I'm just looking at the how how far does it go? Twenty kilometers. You're looking at uh, range. Uh, okay, so um, kind of like covering the whole. The, like if you're on one of these yeah, islands, yeah. islands are pretty small. It could potentially reach the, to the other side of the island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll have a Grenada. You'll have a. You'll have different islands will have their own cruiser nets. They're called, mm-hmm. uh, and also this is Facebook net. groups. Every island has a Facebook group, and they're amazing. Uh, the Facebook groups. Um, people are so helpful. The, the, I'll tell you something now. I, I, the the nicest people I've ever met in my life are sailors. They're the most helpful, kind, happy people I've ever met. The um the, the people will just come over to your boat and help you out if you have an issue. They're always willing to help. You go to the marina bars. If you want to see how old the happiest like older people in your life, just go to a marina bar. They're everyone just they're all really happy, happy people. I was the youngest sailor by miles everywhere I went. Uh, really? And I'm 36. Yeah. Everyone else is much, much older. Uh, Why do you think a, that I is? I was a baby. Because it's something retired people do. Like, you know, it, it's not... Because I was in a little crappy boat. Most of these people are in, you know, there's 
they're in hundred grand to half a million boats, you know, catamarans and nice 40, 50 footers. They, they did this for retirement. Most of them are retired. This is a kind of like been their dream. It's couples usually. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's a lot of older couples. Actually kind and, of, and you, do, yeah, go, go on. Go ahead, go ahead. And the stories you hear, oh, at Marina's, wow. I, I could, like, you think my stories are good. Uh, I could tell, I, after I finish up my stories, I'll tell you some of the stories that I heard from other sailors and really just, I mean, it really, people think have this idea of sailing as kind of this leisurely thing that's kind of, um, you know, they think of like, it's sort of their vision of a utopian paradise, uh, the lifestyle, but it's, it's remarkably dangerous. Um, and very, very adventurous. It is, it's, I have been to war zones dressed as Mexican pirates, Somalia, Syria, Cote d'Ivoire, as I've explained before. Honestly, sailing is the most adventurous thing I've ever done. Uh, it's, it's, you're really out there on your own. You're completely self-sufficient. You have to figure things out. There were things I had to figure out on the fly, like rigging and as you'll see later on about engines in the middle of the ocean and bad weather that there's no one coming to help you. Mm-hmm. Um, Especially that's one of the things that scares me the most is I've never even owned a car, you know, (laughs) and I'm like, I would have no idea how to tinker with a motor. Well, there's I had a manual. (laughs) They come with manuals. And I had to. Yeah, uh, I learned a lot because I know nothing about motors. Uh, I had to to learn the hard way. Um, But um, so tell me some other ways that it's like a whole different world. Okay, so even just the dinghy culture, you know, like, you know, the, your typical night out, you know, you get ready on the boat. Um, I had a fridge there, you know, usually you have a bottle of rum, get, have a few warm up brews, you shave, you're, you put on some music, you know, a uh, portable speaker, maybe smoke something because you're, you're on the islands, it's cheap, right? So you smoke a drink and you're getting all geared up. Then you're getting on the dinghy, which is kind of funny because it's like pitch black. You have these little headlights. You, all, mm-hmm. you always go out with your little headlights. And you're kind of, it could be, it could be just, uh, you know, a minute to the nearest place to tie your dinghy, or it could be 15 minutes. You could be very long distances to the nearest point where you can tie your dinghy to the, where the restaurants and bars are, depending mm. on where you anchor and stuff. Um, so it, it's kind of, a, it's a, it's a weird thing, like going out and getting on these dinghies and then you go to all these marina bars and they've all these, you know, it's all sailors and it, it's all these different events and stuff it's kind of a very unique thing and just the whole thing about going out and getting being completely drunk everyone is by the way sailors are all alcoholics they're drinking every single night like every single night is a holiday when you're a sailor like it, there's something going on all the time and then the, everyone gets on these old people like, they get on completely hammered to their dinghies and um, they just go back to the boats and getting on the boat can be very difficult at night time if you if it's choppy uh, the boat could be banging side to side and you kind of like my boat my mom and my dad fell into the water trying to get getting on and off dinghies uh, you know drunk you know or even if sometimes you, you have to just beach the dinghy so you have to like mm-hmm. kind of ride up on the beach jump out of the water pull up the dinghy and you know then there's waves trying to launch it back out into the sea you can get absolutely drowned you always have like a waterproof bag it's, it, a lot can go wrong and and sad sadly uh, to illustrate this point my very first uh, bar, I went to Rogers Beach Bar, Hog Island. I met this guy called Richard. Uh, he's an 80-year-old 80, 80 English guy. He had crossed the um, Atlantic five times. And two weeks later, his body was found in that exact bay because uh, he got in the dinghy drunk. They don't know what happened to him. I guess he tried to board his boat, maybe hit his head or something like that, and his body was found. So there's all that, a lot of, all of that kind of stuff happens. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's a, there's no drink driving police when you're out in the ocean. Um, yeah, it's just so, it's just so a, a different world. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And sleeping, sleeping, uh, you, you, you know, the rocking side to side, it's not for everybody. I find it quite nice, but sometimes if it's bad, you just can't sleep. It's impossible. Um, really? but you'll, you'll notice that you, your, 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 your rhythms change. Like you, you end up waking up at six or seven in the morning, it just becomes normal because you work with the sun. And because mm-hmm. you have so much sun exposure uh, during the day, you get so tired at nighttime. Like you just you just collapse into the deepest sleep you possibly. And you're always you always have a few drinks on you as well. So you, <laughs> you get the big, heavy, heavy nine hour sleeps where you don't know what's going on. Oh, and uh, actually speaking about uh, not what's going on, I'll tell you another little story that I missed uh, in Guadeloupe, um, in the capital Bast here. 
a notoriously bad anchorage. Uh, that, that it's where the boat actually ended up when I looped back when I when I sold it. But um, me and Hunter, this guy Hunter, we we're absolutely smashed drunk. This the anchor the, is a bad anchorage because it's all weedy, so the anchor didn't hold. So the anchor at one point lost uh, during the night, storm, lashing rain, just piling down the rain, and the anchor came loose during the night. We had no idea, and this is very close to shore. And I wake up around three o'clock to the biggest bang slam into something that's unheard. And it was the biggest boom right by my head. Fuck, Jesus Christ, the panic. I get up, what the fuck? Lash the rain. I go outside, I slammed into another boat. So, and it's like pouring rain and, and we're all panicking and stuff like this. And the boats are kind of loose in the anchorage. And I, I just see this this naked fr- old French guy, this six year old, his dick hanging out and everything, just like comes up. And he, I think he was drunk as well. And he's just staring at me. We're both staring at each other, like I'm in my underwear, lashing rain. And and he just goes, I was like, "Parlez vous anglais?" And he just goes, "Go away!" <laughs> <laughs> so we are in the middle of the rain. We had to like pull up the anchor. We had to find some spot. And we had to like re-anchor and it compete pitch black. Uh just and we we I couldn't even see where the shoreline was. I didn't know how deep I had I had to just go on the depth sounder basically to see make sure we were deep enough so we didn't sla- you know go uh, oh god. But th- this this happened to me three times where the anchor broke loose while I was asleep and caused all sorts of incidents. But anyway, that was one of them. That was Jeez, the worst. Because it looks like Bass Tear is like pretty much open. With no no coverage. Oh, it's terrible! It's the worst. That was the worst anchorage I, I stayed at, and and there, it it's famously every everybody cause people kind of have to stop there because of the, where it is, uh. Or, but everyone avoids it if they can, and it's the I hate that town. Oh, yeah, it's my f- least favorite place in the whole Caribbean. It's a it's it's a provincial capital, so it's capital of Guadeloupe, but it's only the admin capital. The actual main city is Port-au-Prince, which is pretty cool. But this place doesn't even have a bar. Like it's a it's a capital without a bar. And just a, it's the only place where I saw a little like crack whores and it's just an awful, terrible place. I hate that place. And the anchorage is dire. And the, I don't know if you can zoom in there right at the bottom. Uh, there's a you'll notice there's a marina there. And that's actually where the boat that was yep. his resting place. That's where the boat that was my final destination. That's where I left the boat in the end uh, uh, when I looped back down to sell I do. it. Marina de Rivière Saint. Yeah, Ur- yeah. Urbair. Good. I, I was so happy when I sold that boat that I didn't have to go back to that shithole town. Uh, I was because it was the worst place to leave the boat. Cause I was like, oh god, I hate it. It's the middle of nowhere. But anyway, that's a different thing. But uh, yeah. So yeah, sleeping, sleeping. Uh, so yeah, everything is kind of so, different. What's the solution? What's the solution to sleeping? Like, if you had a catamaran, it would be more balanced, I guess, and then it would probably be more yeah, less rocky. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, nearly every boat was less rocky than my boat because I, I I have these old, this classic plastic old folk boat style are very narrow. The narrower the boat, the more it sways. So I had the mm-hmm. swayest boat. Sometimes you, you you go back on the dinghy and it looks like it's about to heel over. It's just bang inside the side. It looks so ropey. Um, and it's kind of spooky, you know, at night you come up and you just, from out of the black, you just see the silhouette of this boat rocking side to side and that's where you're going to stay for the night. It's very creepy. Uh, <laughs> um, awful if you're trying to if, like if you if you're if you're a sailor and you think that um, you know it, it's if, if you're if you're trying to get a girl back to your place, it's a whole it's e- easy enough to get them back to the hotel, but like you know try oh, let's 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 go get on this on little dinghy. dinghy, come across yeah. all these waves, and it gets to this abandoned boat, <laughs> different kind of and thing, it's, and it's like rocking like crazy. Yeah, 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 and it's like old and crap, but. Uh, you know, you can you can imagine uh, it's if you were there seeing it for the first time, like what the hell? It's not like come back to my place for a couple of drinks, even if you're having friends back. It's like no thanks. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's it's just different. And the thing about it is the, a few bad things because you only have the one dinghy, so you got to kind of come home as a group, or you can kind of like drop people back to the boat and come back, mm-hmm. and then you're on your own. So you kind of just got to think a bit more about what you're doing. Um, yeah, and but other like the but the having those those sunsets 
you know, when you when you've done a good day sail and you park up at a lovely anchorage and you're by the beach and you're watching the sunset and you're in this new that new port energy, I call it. Like you can get jaded very quick saying, but when you re- arrive at a new port and the sun is set and you've just arrived, you crack, you put on the tunes, you make a rum punch for yourself, and you're just dancing on top of the boat. You're ready to go. It's like, yeah, it's that, oh, that's a great feeling. Um Yeah, that's a good uh, vibe. Yeah. So and you you appreciate things so much more when you're saying like if you go to uh like showering as well, by the way. Showering and toilet stuff, uh we had this this sailing bag it's uh, called a solar shower so you fill this bag up and it has like a black side and it heats up during the day you hang it on the mast and it has a little nozzle so that's how you you uh, you shower why would you need to shower though because you're in the caribbean it's warm can you just take a dip in the ocean yeah but it's very salty uh you know this is uh-huh. fresh water you use um so just to I, get the salt off yeah and it's really cool in some places you have boats that come up to your boat like and they'll like sell you They'll sell you diesel, like right, they have these big barges that sell you diesel, they'll pump you full of water, or they'll sell like, you have people coming up selling you jewelry sometimes on the boat. There's a whole like market, floating marketplace. It's a, it really is a different world. Um, but, so what do you do for food? Uh, so usually uh, uh, it, was, it was a pleasure because, uh, you know, you a lot of fish in the Caribbean. Uh, did manage to catch a fish at one point. That's in the next bit of the sailing trip. I failed miserably before that, but uh, we'd eat out a lot of restaurants. Most nights we'd eat out, but a lot, uh, you know, for breakfast and stuff, we go to the market, get vegetables, eggs, cook up in the uh, cook up in the boat. You know, there's a gas cooker there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you have your coffee, make up a meal. Yeah, you know, so, so that's pretty standard. Like the even on your tiny little boat. No offense, you yeah. uh, had uh, the, yeah, yeah, uh, standard. You yeah. had you had the, the the you know the the equipment necessary to make a coffee and and make some eggs. Yeah, these these pocket cruisers are designed to live on. You know, they they have uh, like two. You have two kind of two stoves, I guess, or two uh, mm-hmm. places to burners. Put yeah. yeah, two burners. Um, you have your toilet, you have a bed. You have everything you need on a boat. Um, and people live okay. like loads of people live on them permanently. In fact, I didn't read it really copy, but there's it's a whole it's a great very cheap way to live if you're not sailing <laughs> if you're just staying in port it's like free rent and people just you see all these old I'm, guys I'm very curious about this <laughs> you see yeah you see all these old guys uh, who've been doing it for 20 years who just like living off the boat for years never even move port they find a place they like and they just kind of that's their life they just that's and, they, and they can park for free because yeah. like the mooring is free yeah, uh, yeah, they put down their own mooring and they just live there for free, and that's the kind of. That's and and so life. your only, I guess, ongoing cost is the probably like some sort of boat insurance, or do you not even need that? Uh, you only need boat or like insurance. Like a license? No, you don't need license. You only need boat insurance. The only time you need boat insurance is if you're going to get taken out uh, of the water for repairs. Um, they'll ask the boatyard will ask for that. Uh, that's it. Some marinas will ask for it, of course, as well. Um. And so where do the, where do you get like the, I, you kind of alluded to it, but where do you get the gas for, uh, I guess for the stove or is it electric? And then like, uh, it's gas, yeah. uh, it's gas. So how do you get the gas like in the, in the boat? So there's all the, like on the water, you'll see, you'll have, uh, you'll have places where you can refuel, uh, they're like little petrol stations, but on the water, you can yeah, tie up your the gas boat stations. there. And so they have the gas stations for like the diesel for the boat. And then they also have the, whatever it's called, natural gas for. Well, the natural gas is basically, uh, you'll get, you'll have a guy, like a local dude who'll collect them all like on a Tuesday and he'll bring you back a full one. Uh, And and, and to be honest, like I. Because it's a little tank. Yeah, but I only used one and a half tanks for four months. Like they're so economical. Gas is amazing. Um, And I'd be using it every day, all the goddamn time. Um, so it, you'd already have to do water is another thing, you know, you, you, I, I had giant, uh, big, um, tanks and I would mm-hmm. like to fill them with water, diesel, whatever needed. And you have to do a few runs. Um, if you, yeah, if you what are the find... considerations of fresh water? Is it pretty? Yeah. I mean, economical? like, you, I mean, yeah, it's pretty economic. You don't, you don't have to do it that often. I mean, you're, you don't drink it. I, 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 I had drinking water separately and use it, use it for washing dishes. Um, and the sh- solar showers, you know, you don't use that much of it. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's kind of it. like day-to-day. Your day-to-day could be, you know, going and provisioning. We call it provisioning. Maybe. Provisioning. Yeah, provisioning. <laughs> yeah, like exactly. it. yeah. So, but I, I imagine those beach beachfront restaurants, they're not expensive, but they're not cheap either if you're doing it every night. And then what? So you kind of have to like trek into town and find like a fruit market or... 
Yeah, I mean, you can. It depends on where you are. Certainly, some islands are quite expensive. Like you're definitely dropping twenty, twenty, thirty bucks uh, on food a night. Um, so, uh, but then you can go to a place where it's like a local rotisserie chicken place, and you'll get a whole chicken for like five bucks. You know, so mm-hmm. it, it depends. You can do it whatever way you want. There's cheap ways of doing things, and and the French islands alcohol is expensive, but in the other islands is dirt cheap. Um, mm. So you can you can do it pretty cheap. Um, Day-to-day living costs. Remember, your accommodation's free. Your transportation is, well, in theory, free with the wind. Uh, and, and by the way, you'd be surprised how, how much you spend on diesel. You spend very little. Uh, you can, you can twenty bucks. You could, you could go for hours and 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 hours. Maybe maybe twenty hours. I don't know. Um, but you use very little because they're designed to go through the water pretty handy. But it's very economical. So you think like less than a hundred bucks a month, even if you're hopping islands? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. 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 I'd say, I'd say, uh, it depends on what you're, you're using motor. Some people, they always motor. They're just motor heads as they call them. Uh, I like to sail a lot. I try and avoid the motor because obviously anytime I use the motor, it always ended in disaster, which probably brings <laughs> us, should bring us on to the, the final bit of the trip. We'll just close that loop. Um, yeah, sure, sure. And then if you have some time after, I'd like to ask absolutely. some uh, non non disaster related questions. But yeah, please, uh, please uh, kick us off. Okay, so um, so we lost the fourth day, uh, and I we had to get from St Kitts to uh, St Martin. Me and this guy Moritz without the fourth day, we just used the mainsail and motored right. Mm-hmm. Um, so got up to St Martin, say goodbye to Moritz. He went. He ended up uh, hitching a ride on a boat to Bahamas, I believe. And my brother, my other brother came um, and I spent, we spent about two weeks, St. Martin's kind of a party place, but we spent about two weeks there because I had to figure out a way to get a front sail working. So what I did was I was able to reattach the wire and I converted the front sail to these thing called hanks. So instead of being pulled up a kind of a, a slot, it, you, it's, it's similar to the front sail or the main sail, which is basically these clips and you could just pull up uh you pull it pull it up like you would a mainsail so it slides up on these um on these uh on these clips now the, the only problem with that is easier to get down the sail in a storm or a crisis and easier to get it up it's super easy but you can't roll it so you can't adjust the side the amount of sail that you have so the great thing about a thing called it's called a rolling furler, which is what most boats have which it kind of rolls around the wire so you can have like maybe just 10 percent of the sail out 50%, uh, 70%, you can adjust depending on how much wind you get. So you can alter, if it's too much wind, you can alter it. But with the Hanks, you have to go 100% or nothing, which means it only works in light winds. If it's heavy winds, you can't use it. So I don't, I think I used it, well, I did use it once and the force they snapped again, but that happened a bit later. Um, <laughs> that was a disaster. It was like the last day, the last day I finally said, you know what, back in Guadeloupe, I'll finally test these Hanks out and the whole force they snapped again because mm-hmm. the force of the wind was too much it snapped the wire but um anyway that, that that's that was that's kind of an anticlimactic end but uh, it was more interesting what happened beforehand so my brother he i got him to do the same course as my parents competent crew course so he came out all ready to go and we were sailing from uh st martin to nevis st martin which is a lot oh sorry we we're going to st barts went to st barts first which is an, a french island Mm-hmm. Uh, which which went pretty smoothly, and then we went to Nevis. Now again, when Nevis didn't have a visa for here, we intended just to stop the night and head to Montserrat and Guadeloupe. So anyway, we are heading to Nevis, and uh, it was pretty. Actually, it was a pretty decent day. It was the first time uh, we we're going to this thing place called the Narrows, and the Narrows is this tiny bit of water between Nevis and Saint Kitts. Now, boats that you charter, you're not allowed to go through the narrows because it's there's a lot of uh, it's not very uh, well surveyed. Maybe you can pull it up on a map, you'll see it yourself. And there's a few rocks, underground rocks, and it's it's a small channel, so it can be a bit dangerous. And right at this point, because I I've been trying to fish the whole time, right? And every time I pull in my line, there's just kelp. I just catch kelp. And I thought we were pulling up kelp. We were just coming up to the narrows and said, we better pull in this line because I need to be concentrating for uh, for this bit. And believe it or not, I was like, what? That's not a... It was really heavy. You know? And actually, at some point, we had caught this big albacore tuna. 
So, uh, and uh, we pull it in and we're in the middle of going through the narrows. So I'm trying to like pull in the thing, but I'm staring the boat with my foot. I'm like, God damn it. And uh, it's it's fighting. It starts to come back. So I started fighting and we're trying to find a hook to grab it. And it got to the point where I got it on camera. Thank God. Uh, well, I'll show it in later episodes. My brother literally had to grab the fish with his bare hands at the side of the boat and pull it up on the boat, uh, which is which is pretty cool. But um. That, that that all that all went well. That that all went fine. But and um, we cooked up the cooked the fish. The first time I ever fished was so it was the, very satisfying. But the next day, um, we went, set out for Montserrat, which is this British island. Actually, has a big Irish heritage. Um, because it's a UK colony. Yeah, but it also there was a lot of Irish uh, who escaped the British from St Kitts and and moved there. And they actually kind of they cool. were the first people to settle in the island were were Irish. And in fact, in the flag. Uh, they have a, a harp. It's green. It's a very strong Irish connection. It's and they have the the one of the biggest St Patrick's Day. It's the only other country or only other sorry territory in the world outside Ireland that St Patrick's Day is a national holiday. Um, wow. Yes, and um, but they, they had the strictest COVID rules of all the Caribbean islands. So it was the place I wanted to visit, maybe most. Cause, um, but it was like a week quarantine. It was it was almost impossible to get in, and you couldn't ride by boat as well. You had to fly in. It was a they were still being extremely strict. Thought the sail was going well. We were a bit slow because we had no front sail. Couldn't use the front sail. We had to kind of motor sail with the, the main sail. Thought it was this is all going a bit too grand, too easy. And and the wet the weather at this time of year. So it was coming closer to the summer. So the the seas were calmer than they were at the start of the trip thought it was going well and i noticed around halfway to the trip that i look over and the uh, the lid for where you put in the diesel was not there so i had filled up diesel early in the morning i filled it up with diesel and i forgot to put the goddamn lid back on so for the half of that trip and it was on it was on the side nearest the water. So I just see these waves constantly coming over the edge, filling the tank with seawater. So for about a few hours, little did I know, the tank was filling up with seawater. Any sailor knows, seawater in a diesel tank is a death sentence for the engine. And I I I freak out, right? I freak out. Um so, so uh, funny enough, I, I found the lid. It was in the cockpit. So I was able to screw it back on. But I had to kill, we had to kill the engine because I knew there was uh, diesel. I didn't want to wreck it further. So we had no motor. And this slow. we only had a mainsail. So this slowed it down to the point where we, we end up uh, 3, 4 in the morning. So I never night sailed uh, kind of for maybe for an hour when I was, we're coming to St. Kids. But I never night sailed. We we're forced to night sail in coming into a new port. Uh, we were supposed to maybe anchor up there for the night and then head on to Guadeloupe because we're not supposed to be in Montserrat. Um, and also because of the way the winds were flowing, we couldn't we we couldn't angle into the capital, Little Bay. Now, let me explain something. There was a big volcano in Montserrat uh, not so long ago. Half the island got wiped out. The population is halved. This only happened very recently. And there's an exclusion zone. Uh, there used to be the old capital, Plymouth, it's called. And the only place we could aim for for safety in the night was this exclusion zone. And because of all the lava that had been in the sea, there was there, there was inadequate surveys. But we had to. We basically had no option. We'd we'd no. We don't need the mainsail. Which, by the way, when we hit the lee side of the island, we basically lost wind power. So um, we we couldn't. We were dead in the water again. Because the the wind the wind is being blocked by the island. And remind us uh, what what the lee side means. So the lee side is the Caribbean side of the island. So 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 windward and leeward they're the two sides, right? So windward gotcha. is when you're on uh, the. In and this the case, wind the wind comes from the Atlantic, I guess. Yeah. So if you're on the east side of an island, you're on the the windward side. Okay. Gotcha. It, you're on the leeward side if it's you know in in protection of the the island. But this kill mm-hmm. this it's you know a lot of these islands are quite mountainous, a lot of volcanoes. Uh, and it and it blocks all the wind, so it really kills it. So most a lot of these times, when you come up the Caribbean side, you have to motor because you, there's no wind, you know. Mm. So wind dies. D- water in the diesel tank. 
we're down the water. It's three in the morning. We're so tired. We've been sailing since six in the morning. I expected to get in there, you know, by six o'clock. But now it's nine hours later or whatever, seven hours later. And it's three o'clock in the morning. I, I, sorry, I don't know if it was three o'clock in the morning. It might have been one o'clock in the morning. It was very late. I can't remember exactly what time. Uh, we're just exhausted and we, we're dead in the water. And we're, we're getting pushed out by the sea basically to Venezuela, essentially, because I, I, I didn't really, like our trajectory was Venezuela because we're getting pushed out so much because the, because another thing, when the wind is coming from the east, so is the the waves. So you're con- when you're sailing in the Caribbean, you're constantly being pushed west. So I'm like, we are going to, if we just, we're dead in the water. So we're going to be pushed out towards Central America. Uh, what, we have no choice but to run the engine with the, with the, with the salt water in it. The mix. See how it goes. Yeah. Did not go well, turns out. Uh, <laughs> so it works for like a time. I just hear that it's like... Dies. So... And every so often, I, 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 we, we, we tried it again. I would work for like maybe a couple of minutes. Um... What did I do? What did I do? Oh, yes. I. What did I do again? I would. Yeah, I, basically, I was forced to do something that I would. I loaded doing in Grenada, which was I had to basically pump out, uh, pump out the seawater, pump out diesel, the old diesel from the tank manually mm-hmm. and replace it with fresh diesel and. Uh, how could I, how can I explain the difficulty of this? Especially, it was hard enough to do. It took me like fifty tries to do when I was on flat water. This was like in in the ocean. So, we're, I was I was trying to figure out how to get decent uh, decent fuel, healthy fuel, or some sort of healthy fuel into the um, into the into the tank. And what I realized was, uh, I took some seawater and I took some diesel. I put them in a a plastic cup or a, pla- a plastic mm-hmm. bottle and i wanted to see how they how they interacted with each other and what i realized was the the seawater shrank straight to the bottom of the of the the bottle so i realized that they, they didn't mix at all you know so i realized that okay so the seawater must have because we we paused the engine for so long the seawater must all be at the bottom where it collect where the the, the diesel like in the, sorry where it takes in the fuel so the when we turn the engine back on it was getting nothing but seawater Basically, that's why it stopped. So I figured, hey, uh, if I bleed the engine a bit um, and we just keep trying it and trying and try, eventually it'll flush out the seawater and it'll go back to the ratio will get better and better. But there was so much damage done in that process. So so that, this theory did work. Um, this t- theory did work. I, I emptied out the filters because the filters were filthy. Were full of, they're, full of, uh, they're full of all this crap from the sea. And got the this fresh um fuel in got it kind of working it would break down get it working break down get it working but over hours and hours and hours we eventually sail into this uh beach and it's at night time my brother has never anchored in his life he's new to sailboats and we have to sail into anchor again because of this problem with the the engine and we're sailing directly towards the beach i'm like pull down the mainsail he has no idea how to pull down a mainsail uh, so we're just heading towards the beach. It's getting shallower and shallower. He's like, he's like, he's completely flustered. Doesn't know what's going on, and we have to maneuver to get the get the sail down, throw in the anchor, and then hope for the best. And we end, short. Long story short, we end up shipwrecked there for around three days. Had to go illegally um, on land. Had, I had to I had to completely replace all the diesel. So I, t- I emptied out the diesel tank. Managed to get the thing working, and uh, immigration copped on. Customs immigrant. It's a tiny island, right? That was it was still in lockdown. They copped on that the our boat was there illegally, uh, because um, one of the customs officers happened to be visiting the beach the last day we were there with his family, mm. and he asked, "What's the name of your boat?" And I said, "Trade Winds." He goes, "Like you're not on the manifest. I work for customs." And it was late enough at night where he said, "I'm gonna, you know, basically he's gonna we're gonna get arrested the next day." Um, for being on the island legally, we're there three days at this point, or we're going to get apprehended, probably getting the boat confiscated. Um, so basically, we had to speed off and escape Montserrat in the middle of the night. Boat uh, chase. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Basically, but we, like, if we left super, super early, they wouldn't reach us because because we were down the south of the island. They were up the north of the, the capital. So I figured if we leave super, super early, by the time they wake up and bring and the the, the, the customs and immigration come up to where we were, we'd have we'd already left their their territory. So, um, but that that was actually a really cool place. Monster was really cool because we were there three of the islands. We we're having a good time there. Uh, very, very cheeky what we did, but um. Yeah, I don't care. It's, uh, it's COVID times, but uh, so we 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 got there, and then we went headed towards uh, Guadeloupe. The engine cut out a couple of times, but it kind of was working. Um, you know, it, it, we sailed most of it, and then finally ended up at, and that was because we couldn't use the engine. That took we had to do night sail again, so we had to sail through the day and then into the night to Guadeloupe. Um, we ended up anchoring off the coast of Northern Guadeloupe. We anchored at night, so couldn't check the anchor. There was actually, a, uh, they had just lifted the restrictions. What does that mean, check the anchor? Like, uh, we go, so we threw down the anchor in the port and checked the anchor to make sure it holds so okay. you're secure. A very windy anchorage called Deshay. I think it's called Deshay. And it was the first weekend that Guadalupe had lifted restrictions. So there was actually a big fucking party on, uh, going on till four in the morning. Uh, at the, so we were like, oh my God, it was only like one o'clock or something. So we like get on the dinghy, get ready really fast. And we ended up partying. It was like, we we're so happy we made it. And Guadeloupe was like my final, because uh, the boat had had it at this stage. I knew, I knew I had, Guadeloupe was the only place that had a marina because there was no, Nevis has no place to store it. St. Kitts and Nevis is terrible for boats. There's no place to store it, basically. Uh, no marinas. Montserrat had none. So Guadeloupe was the first place, it was the first safe haven uh, from St. Martin. And I knew that was, the trip was done by then because the boat had had it. We had no, like the, Oh, I should mention on this trip, we tried the force day. The force day snapped, uh, as I said again. Um, the hanks didn't work, uh, or said so the it was too much force. So, so motor was done. The force day was done. We limped to Deche, uh, which is near Bast here, and we were partying. It was like a, it was a great feeling just to be near land because we knew there was no more offshore sailing to be done. But then we wake up the next morning. I I, sorry, I wake up the next morning because because you know I can't it can't end on high. Uh, and I noticed the sky is rotating. Now skies don't rotate. It's, you know, you know, uh, clouds don't rotate. And of course, <coughs> I, I, I popped my head out. The anchor had broken free, and we were headed right into load of rocks. We were in push load into rocks. So it's like, wake up! It's totally so, so hungover. We're like scrambling, get the engine on, and have to <laughs> have to prevent being slammed into load of rocks. Um, yeah, and uh, so that was that. And then we ended up in Bast here. Same thing happened again the very last day. Bro- anchor broke in that notoriously bad anchorage and we had to scramble. But eventually limped in, limped into the marina. They, ha- they Thank God they had a place because all the other marinas were booked up as well. That was another problem I had. All the marinas, um, uh, it, it was so it was busy season. But there was one place in this, in this marina. I could leave it there and finally get rid of the boat. My last thing that happened was... Got the boat into the berth, but I missed the mooring, the support mooring boy to throw the rope over right right at the berth. So I, to prevent the boat slamming into another boat, just as, literally just as we were parking, I had to dive into the water and tie it up. I don't know if you've ever dived into a marina, into the water marina. You should never do that. You know why? Because where, where do all the toilets flush? There's no holding mm. tanks. They flush. Dude, I came out of there looking like the SWAT monster. So like I was like I was literally floating past like swimming past bits of shit. I was oily. It was like I was black and there was shit in my hair, and it was like I, and I, I had to pull myself. So after doing the morning, by I crawled up the walls looking like this monster thing, and that was the last time. It was that was the way it ended. The trip ended. <laughs> <laughs> so it ended in Guadeloupe. Yeah, uh, me covered in crap. Uh, so I had a shower. Then I was so happy I, and. I hated that town, but um, got it sold there. Thank God, it, while I was uh, while I was away, I didn't have to come back. But uh, but then after that, it didn't end in Guadeloupe because I said I was planning. I left Dominica because I wanted. To, I was thinking I was going to end in Grenada. Uh, you know, if I got all the way back down, but it, right, the boat had had it. So me and my brother, we flew to Dominica then because the last country to tick off the list, the whole Caribbean, and so yeah. it was amazing. Got to have land shits. You don't appreciate land shits. To uh, to <laughs> till you stay in a boat for a long time, and like uh, you know, uh, sh- love showers, beds, 
Uh, so we spent a week, and Dominica is amazing. It's the most beautiful island you could possibly imagine. Uh, it's famous. It's called the Nature Island. It has waterfalls, all these amazing treks, volcanoes. And mm-hmm. spent a week there just absolutely enjoying that. As I, it, was, it was a real vacation, and that's how the trip ended. It was a, w- a wonderful way uh, to end the trip exploring that island. And I'd finished every, I'd, the mission complete, my mission was to finish every country in the region, did it, sailed it, overcome all these incredible obstacles, learned a lot about myself. I aged, man. I aged. I, I've literally, have way more gray hairs. The sk- skin exposure, I said the sun exposure, my skin, I, I feel older. And emotionally and spiritually, man, it really just aged me. Uh, it was an experience. Wow. And uh, did you make it to Anguilla? I you know I did. I, uh, Anguilla is up on Saint Martin. We we could have mm. taken a a day trip because pr- the the only islands up there I didn't visit were Anguilla and Seba. Uh, Seba is this tiny island. It's supposed to be amazing, um, but it was just too out of the way, and it's a it's really really bad place to. Like you can't anchor there because it's a giant volcano, basically, and it's so steep too. You have to use these mooring buys. It's notorious. Actually, it's a it's a British overseas territory, so it wasn't necessary. I didn't cross, care. Cross I didn't yeah. give a crap about Anguilla. Yeah. It's a, it's not a country. Uh, apparently, it's expensive. It's just beaches. It's like a tourist British place. I had zero interest in going. And also, it's beside Saint Martin. So if I ever went back to the region, I wanted to kind of save a little bit of something because I I want to go back to Seba as a vacation. And you have to go to St. Martin to go to Seba. And Anguilla is right there. So I thought yeah, I had no interest in going. Um, St. Martin was where I wanted to go because it's, it's the fun. It's like famous for its nightlife. It's kind of like, and it's a big uh, boating scene. St. Martin is a really cool spot. Um, it was kind of a good ending point. Uh, no interest. Yeah, I, um, could have taken the, the ferry over to the day trip, but nah. um, yeah. So the trip aged you. You're a wiser man for it. I'm a lot more zen. I like dealing with all that stuff. Nothing bothers me, honestly. I'm so like people have noted it since I came home. You know, things going wrong with business and uh, just just general panic stuff that people normal people would panic about. I just nothing bothers me anymore. I'm so I've been through. I feel like I've been through hell and back. So I'm kind of very zen now. Yeah, absolutely, and. um uh, when we were talking offline, you said that uh, you, you had, you know, being on the boat, you had a lot of time to do some thinking. Yeah, well, you're at the helm for eight, nine hours uh, on average a day, sometimes 12 hours, sometimes 18. Uh, and you're kind of just you in the water. Uh, something about being at sea, nothing, it, it, it simplifies life, you know, it's just a, a basic plane. You're very clear-headed. It's very relaxing, you, and you don't care about anything else. Like I, I don't think I checked any emails or didn't worry about my. I, luckily, I had good managers in place. Didn't have to worry about the business at all. Um, yeah, you just, it's just you and nature, and it, you feel like you're out there with some sort of force. I don't know if you call it. Some people would call it God or something, but the universe. I don't know, but it, it's just you, and that's it. You and nature, and there's there's nothing, nothing else. And it's it's a it's an amazing feeling. Uh, and it, yeah, it gives you t- time to reflect on life. You know, what are you, I was, I kept thinking like, what am I doing here? Um, well, am I doing this to prove something to myself? Um, am I doing it for other people? I don't think so. I've done that enough. Uh, uh, maybe a little bit though, you know, just kind of prove myself or maybe some thing about masculinity. Was it like, oh yeah, I feel like a man now, but if I, I think I dealt with a lot of those issues earlier in my life, um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I feel like it kind of finished an arc for me because the whole Mexican pirate thing, uh, when that ended, the sailing bit almost was like a cruel joke uh, I had on myself to do it after because I feel like I, I, okay, I LARPed as a pirate for 10 years in nightclubs with sombreros and swords. <laughs> I was like, I feel like I really have to be an actual pirate uh, or, you know, a sailor. Like, I feel like I, Otherwise, I kind of feel like sort of a, you know, like, what am I doing? I'm like a guy in a costume. And I, I don't know. Part of me wanted to just make it real. Um, Makes yeah. Sense. And were, were you reading uh, books about the history of, um, I guess, the history of exploration and, um, y- you know, the age of discovery of these islands and um, uh, things like that to get to get a bit of a historical context? 
Yeah, I I I love history. Uh, I really am into it. So everywhere I went, I would consume uh, a lot of history. You know, whether it be listen to podcasts. Obviously, I had a, I had a few books with me as well. Um, yeah, I I, I was super interested in uh, in in all that aspect of things. I mean, the islands have a very very interesting history, but esen- essentially it boils down to mostly like eighty nine percent of it is the British and French going at it. That's uh, that's that's the story of most of the Caribbean, and it's interesting the nuances and differences in each country. I, I much prefer the Windward Islands, which is the southern the southern ones like uh, Grenada, um, Saint Lucia, Saint Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, not a big fan of the French islands. Uh, people are just a bit less friendly. It's very touristy. They're the most populated islands. Um, uh, you, you, Domin- I love Dom- Dominica. It's the least visited one. Uh, and uh, if you go up north, St. Kitts, Nevis, Antigua, Barbuda, St. Martin, it becomes very, um, let's, say, let's say, more European, more a lot more white people, a lot more developed, um, a bit more familiar, less adventurous, uh, and a little less friendly in a way. Because uh, if you go to the Southern Islands, they just don't have that many foreigners so they're a bit more uh, with the exception of saint lucia but they're a bit more welcoming i suppose um mm-hmm. yeah it, it, the, there was the little nuances is, is is was interesting uh, i i don't want to end the podcast without asking about the boat hitchhikers and that so, sort oh, of yeah, whole network absolutely. the whole network of uh i don't know uh just well, like let's bring it back to your readers know each other's and the, yeah. and the facebook groups and all that so so if you if you're out there and you're feeling adventurous, guys, and you wanted to hitch a lift on a boat across the Atlantic, it's pretty easy to do actually. If you go down to Portugal, they all depart part from Portugal. So they, this kind of the route they take is Portugal down to the Canary Islands, right? And there's two routes you can go. Some go directly across from the Canary Islands, but most go down to Cape Verde in Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of captains with boats want to do this crossing to the Caribbean. Uh, and they're looking for crew, uh, and this, so there's these. They do it either live on the spot. You know, these are older people, so a lot of like hanging up flyers, or you'll, you'll, you'll go to marina bars and marinas, and you'll see flyers for people your crew wanted. And usually, what happens is, so you have a lot of young people who do this. Some of them know basic sailing. Some of them don't know anything about sailing. And usually, the crew actually pay the captain. So it could be a ten euros a day, you know, for prov- if you know it helps with provisioning fuel. Um, sometimes cap- uh, captains will even pay crew if they're competent for the trip, but usually it's kind of like you pay your way a bit. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a whole, whole ecosystem and it, it's very, these people who come across the Atlantic, um, these young people, they're, they're amazing. They're, they're, you know, in their twenties, they're taking backpack into a whole nother level and they've got some great <laughs> stories. And this brings me to some great stories I hear. Like you should get, maybe you should talk to Moritz, my ma- the guy I was, uh, the hitchhike across the Atlantic. I'll get you on to him. He's a really, really cool guy from Germany. He's still going around the world, uh, hitchhiking on boats. Uh, he's got, he got some great stories. Um, where, where in Portugal do they leave from? Uh, I, I, I think just the Algarve. I think there's, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, maybe Faro um, or Lagos. That that'd be the bottom of Portugal. The earlier you can intercept the boats, the more of a chance you have of finding a boat. Because I know a lot of people who get go to the Canaries uh, can be can find it have a difficult time if you, especially if you don't arrive early, because people have a lot of people have stocked up on crew in Portugal. But but the Canaries is the main spot. It, it, the earlier okay. you can get there in the season, I'm talking. You want they cross usually? I think October. You want to get there. Um, October, November so that's might like be the a bit best late. time of year to do the crossing. Yeah, yeah, because you want to get over to the Caribbean for uh, the start of the season, which is around you know, mm, December. Yeah, like this between December, January. Usually, the boats want to be over there for January, February, and get the whole season before June. And uh, where in the Canaries specifically are they often meeting up? Is it all over Tenerife the place? Or no, it's all over group? the place. Uh, yeah. There's marinas all over the place. I mean, um, yeah, and the, there's Facebook groups for it. It's usually, uh, you know, uh, what do you search? Canaries cruisers group, Grenada cruisers group. So or, cruisers are, is the keyword. Like when you're in the Caribbean yeah, and you're checking the, the Facebook group for every country. You're looking and there's actually for an Atlantic Grenada crossing. Cruisers. Yeah, and there's actually an Atlantic crossing Facebook group for this exact purpose. Okay. Yeah, it's it's called Atlantic Crossing East to West, and there's another one from West to East. 
Um, so yeah, it's a fa- it's a fascinating thing, and you know, oh god, speaking of you know, just ending up with some stories, I hear the uh, sure, um, you know, there was a go- there was ones who were crossing back over, and they they lost the mast, and they ran out of fuel, and had to get rescued. There was a another guy who um, it was really interesting. The one, most interesting one was this guy was in the Pacific. Well, you know, the Pacific is a big, big ocean, and they hit a storm, and they lost the the mast. And so you're absolutely on your own. I mean, when you leave Panama to get to the next island, uh, the Marquise, I think it's called, um, you're talking about a month without land on a good boat. The bigger the boat, the faster it sails. But on a good boat, it's it's 30 days without land. They got uh, hit a typhoon or whatever, and they're called in the Southern Hemisphere. I think they're called typhoons in the Southern Hemisphere, but um, lost the mast. So they were stranded and uh, they had to construct a mast out of the boon which is the bottom part of the what, what supports it's basically another piece of metal at the bottom, okay. bottom of the mast and they had to make like this tiny little sail and they spent like three months just trying to find land and they had to like fish and they had they had a rainmaker they, uh, you can be completely self-sufficient on a boat by the way because you can get solar panels i had a wind generator for example for power uh, which you know uh, it's like a fan or a turbine uh, you can have solar panels and then for water you have a thing called a rain maker or water maker which actually desalinates seawater and supplies you with fresh water. So you can even, uh, and then if you take into account fishing, you can be completely 100% self-sufficient on the boat because you got the transport free, your accommodations free, you can cook, uh, you know, you, you can fish and uh, you can generate water. So you can survive uh, in any conditions on a, on a boat. And that's how they did. And they were, because they, anyone crossing the Pacific has to, basically wouldn't, or crossing an ocean, most people wouldn't cross an ocean, uh, especially the Pacific without a ra- uh, water maker. So a lot of people do it wi- on the Atlantic because there's so many boats coming across the Atlantic that you send out an SOS call, you're probably going to get taken care of. But the Pacific, mm-hmm. you know, you want to be, you want to have that boat sorted. And my boat had previously been a- taken across the Atlantic by a, a guy who owned it for 40 years, a British guy. So this is why it had the likes of um, the likes of a, a, a wind, uh, what you call it, a wind generator on it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, you sold uh, you sold the Caribbean boat in Guadeloupe. Uh, you still have uh, the other boat in the Med. If you were going to do this again, um, either, either in the Caribbean or just like maybe in a, a different part of the world, uh, there's definitely a lot of a cool... There's a lot of cool zones for for boating and stuff. How would you how would you do it differently next time? Would you get a different type of boat, a bigger boat? Yeah, uh, yeah. Tell me. Well, uh, listen, I, I need a break. That that was <laughs> I needed like a ten year break. I'm talking ten year break. Um, <laughs> uh, I would do it if I was doing it again. I would de- I definitely get a bigger boat. Definitely like a fifty footer or a forty footer. Uh, ideally a catamaran if I had the cash. Um, I get a newer boat. So I just spend more money on it because because I'm a new sailor, I got a new new uh, kind of a, a beginner boat, and I didn't want to blow out a cash in it because as you can see, I kind of wrecked the first one. I wrecked I wrecked both of them. One set fire, the one in the Mediterranean, and this one ran aground, lost all the sails. Blah, blah, blah. So thank God I didn't spend money on it. Uh, but now I have a bit more experience. I get a nice boat, you know, somewhere that you you enjoy like actually being on. That's not old, and so something bigger, newer. A bit more expensive, um, well, a lot more expensive. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I love a catamaran, but catamarans aren't great for crossing oceans. Uh, they're, they're the most comfortable, but uh, I, I'd love to do maybe one day, maybe one day when I have kids or I'm a bit older, like 50, 60, do the, the Pacific because the Pacific lends itself to sea exploration because there's so many islands. Maybe the last countries I ever take off on my list will be the Pacific countries and it's best done by boat, but it's a huge undertaking. Uh, I have no interest in the ego, um, the sorry, the bragging rights that come with crossing oceans. I have no desire to cross the Atlantic for the sake of it. Everyone I talked to who did it said it's super boring and you're just basically a month uh, just kind of doing nothing. I mean, the thing is you're going one direction. You only have to put set your sails once because you're not mm-hmm. changing the direction. And then you just kind of, you're on autopilot essentially. Um, and so you have no desire to just get like a pretty nice 50 foot boat, not too much like uh, effort and just sort of cruise around from your base in Malta and yeah, just sort I, of cruise around the Caribbean and go to, I don't know, go to Sicily and maybe up to Ireland and stuff well, no, like that. Well, I wouldn't go to Ireland a long way, but uh, Sicily, yeah. yes. Uh, in fact, I, I'm only two months ago, I went over to Sardinia to bring it over to Sicily. 
uh, one with my dad and uh, because it's, it's been a while since I've been over there, I couldn't get the engine working. Uh, and we kind of, I, I got it working in the end, but we'd missed right. the weather. I mean, like a bigger boat, like a leisure boat. I don't oh, know. no, no. I, yeah, no. So I'm going to say, I'm, I'm selling the one I have now. Uh, I would, I'm looking at uh, maybe, I'm not sure when, but in maybe the near future, getting like a 40 footer or 38 footer. 38 footer is a really nice size and a, a wide one though. So it has lots of space because, because you got to think about maintenance costs and keeping it in a marina. Uh, 38 foot's a good sweet spot. Um, and it's it, it's easy to handle as a solo sailor because the bigger the boat, the more difficult it is to handle. 38 foot mm. would be a good size. The one I have in Sardinia is only 27. Uh, and also a 38 foot, then I can actually do uh, charter it. So if I have tourists come and they want to party, like six or eight of them, I want mm. to. They, they spend like five six hundred euros a day just to be taken out for to 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 uh, gozo or camino which is the next island over from malta it's just like you go back and forth two hours each way and just mm-hmm. you know make five six hundred quid it'll justify keeping it in the marina there and then maybe you go to greece tunisia all this stuff that's close to me like tunisia is just cross away it's a cool spot has a lot of good mm-hmm. facilities sicily is amazing yeah i i absolutely uh and i i've 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 been seriously considering that uh maybe not maybe maybe two three years i got other priorities right now um, I will actually want to go back to just some basic land traveling, you know, with a backpack <laughs> and stay, you know, or just you know, overlanding it. Uh, I I need a little break from the sea, but yeah, I would, I would. Uh, in fact, I I plan to do it with the other boat, but I'm I'm just done. I went back and it's it's just kind of old and small. I'm like, oh, I'll just sell the thing. Um, the purpose yeah. of that boat was to train for the Caribbean, so the purpose has exhausted itself. I don't want to keep it. And you've probably picked up some stuff about uh, kind of sailing in Latin America. If you just wanted to give us a little bit of free game, because this yeah. is the My Latin Life podcast. Absolutely. Um, I always thought that Panama would be a really cool place to have a boat because you're out of the hurricane belt. And, uh, you know, you got two sides of the ocean there, the Pacific and the, the Caribbean. And um, there's just so many cool islands and it's super tropical and stuff. So I always thought that would be a cool place to. And, and that's typically where you register boats anyway. So I always thought that'd be a cool place to potentially own a boat. Um, and then you could kind of like, I don't know, like rip around the Caribbean, maybe over to Colombia and, and Venezuela from there, stuff like that. Um, what have you kind of like picked up about sailing in um, in, in Latin America? Uh, quite a lot. Um, so I, because my kind of, I had a, I had another plan, plan B, if, if this one didn't go so so I, I so bad. If I couldn't sell the boat, for example, and I got the boat back to Grenada as opposed to Guadeloupe, where I had a free mooring, if that had had hap- had happened, I as opposed to spending, you know, it wasn't cheap the marina in Guadeloupe, but but and if the boat was in good condition, so let's say if the boat was as I left it, and it was in good condition, and I was back to Grenada, I was looking. I did a whole research for a trip where I would go down uh, across the ABC Islands, Venezuela to Cartagena uh, in mm-hmm. fact on this trip I was even considering getting as far as Cartagena but you know hurricane season and all that but um and then yeah so you can go up and down so from Panama up to Mexico Gulf of Mexico back down it's just it's a lot harder to go east so it's very difficult to go east you can do it but you have to tack so it's kind of going in a zigzag and it's just a lot of struggle so if you were if you if you were in Latin America Panama is a great spot uh or Colombia because you can kind of go go up the coast the Caribbean Sea. I said it's harder yeah, to get just, all the. You just hug it. You just hug it along, yeah, like Nicaragua bingo. and Honduras and all yeah, that. Yeah, and it's okay. perfect because that, that's north to south. North to south is the best way to sail in, in the Caribbean, and that's the easiest way to sail. Now, I, I mentioned about doing another trip, a big trip, when I was uh, older, and that's I would buy the boat in Panama because there's so many boats for sail there as well. There's a huge boating community, and of course, they cross the Panama Canal, which, by the way, costs a bit of cash, I believe. And that's how all the boats who end up crossing the Atlantic and want to go through the Pacific, they all come through Panama. And what happens is. A lot of couples, they buy the boat in the, Mediter- or in the Mediterranean, like, oh, we're going to go around the world. They get across the Atlantic and the wife is like, hell no, am I doing another ocean? And they put the boat up for sale in Panama. So there's loads of boats for, for a sale in Panama um, for that trip. So yeah, Panama would definitely be 100% the place to do it. Um, and yeah, so that's uh, what I would do. I mentioned about not having a not ego sailing across an ocean. If I was doing the Pacific, I would definitely cheat. I would skip the whole 30 days at sea, no sea, and I would go start in French Polynesia, which is right in the middle. 
before you mm-hmm. hit any of the other nations. And kind of like you're halfway across then. And that's the fun part because between French Polynesia and Papua New Guinea, that's all the countries and islands. Because the fun bit, being out at sea for, you know, days and days does not appeal to me. I like the port bit. I like the landing on a port, yeah, going to a restaurant. You. you know, that's the fun part. The dinghy. I yeah. agree with you. And so do you think you could make it from like Cartagena to, to Cancun? Oh, yeah. Uh, can, wait, Cancun is on. Yeah, oh, easy. That's an easy trip. That's uh, but it's like the same. It's similar distance to what I did. That's an easy trip. Yeah, that that would be a great trip. You know why that would be good as well, because c- compare Central America to where I was. Right, you're not offshore because you're coastal cruising. It's called co- so. Mm-hmm. There's different. You've coastal cruising and offshore. You're not in open ocean because you're always along the coast. So anything wrong that happens, you're just the land is right there. There's something about seeing land that is very comforting. When you go out and you you can't see land in any direction, that's kind of it's something very unsettling. It's kind of scary. But what, as soon as you can peak an island or peak land, there's something that's kind of okay. It's going to be all right, you know. Um, so you can do that the whole way. I would love to do that trip. Um, and in fact, to be a perfect uh, little spin up, it's the distances are not so big. You've got a lot of variety. I'm. I think there might be a bit more crime there i'm not sure but um because you got to think about crime as well there's a lot of boats get boarded people get killed and it doesn't happen that often but you know people get the people rob boats there's a lot of uh pirates still um but yeah that'd be a good trip if you were thinking about doing something uh yeah i, I mean keep the boat in cartagena or panama that's uh that'd be pretty that'd be pretty amazing that's awesome man you're definitely um Definitely inspiring me and uh, probably the listeners as well. Um, we've been going a while now, um, but we'll, um, I know you, you maybe wanted to touch on like one or two more things just about challenging yourself or about the audience capture. So I don't know, where, what do you want to, what do you want to talk about next? Yeah. So I uh, said a lot of time to re- reflect out there and I, sad as it is to say, like I did feel I said I felt aged by the end of it, and I, I was looking at, uh, you know, where I am in my life. You know, thirty six now, don't have kids yet. Um, I think a lot of that's to do with I said audience capture because because I had this kind of reputation, I felt like I had to maintain with holding on. You know, I think as small as that reputation was, but I I kind of feel like it's um it drove, or it drove me. I didn't drive my life. That kind of thing drove me. I was a victim of what you would call audience audience capture. I wrote about this a couple of years ago uh, in a blog post, but um, it's it's very people is, people are talking about it more today. And I was talking to you about like different dating coaches I know, and you know if you're a dating coach and your income derives from you being a single guy, like good luck starting a family because uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna get out of your own way. But uh, I was I was wondering about sailing there and putting my life in danger so much. I I was thinking God. Um, what part of this was done to kind of show other people that I had it in me or I was cool? I, I did it for myself mainly for the challenge, definitely. But I'm not going to lie and say there was not some part of it that kind of took a little bit of glee and thinking, oh my God, I'm going to get all this cool footage and I'm going to get so much likes and views and all this stupid stuff. Um, and it w- wasn't worth risking your life over. Um mm-hmm. I think only it's, I don't know if this is very good uh, general advice, but I suppose everyone's kind of got the brand of me now with their social media. Everyone's trying to look cool. You know, people die in deaths for Instagram selfies. Um, And especially now we're also glued to our phones and we live in that world, that virtual world so much now in comparison with the the real world. We can get kind of get lost in image and trying to look cool. And you can kind of lose yourself in that. You really can. And, uh, that that was a thought that kept coming to my head because you're out, when you're out there in the sea, no internet, no phones, you're out there and it's just you. You are detached in a way that most people would never be detached in their lifetimes. You know, it's one thing to have no internet connection. It's one thing to have no people around. It's one thing to have absolutely nothing around. And you're effectively a, in a desert. It feels like you're walking into the desert because... There's, the sea is a type of desert. There's nothing, you can't, you are kind of got this little caravan for, of safety, this little thing that's floating that's keeping you safe, but everything else around you is basically death, in, inhospitable death. Um, and when you're out there on your own, you, you, have a, you kind of have a different perspective of 
Like, what the hell am I caring about what anyone else thinks? Like, who gives a shit? It's just me and it's just, it's, that's just all we got. We got this life and you, you're, you're your own company. It's, it's only you and your head at the end of the day. On your deathbed, it's you and you. And I, I think people now are less in touch with themselves than they ever were before. Because they're so busy trying to put up a face or a mask uh, and trying to be what everyone else wants them to be that they they kind of um they kind of get lost in that so i would encourage um people in general to isolate themselves or detach in some way go off i don't sound stupid this whole thing going off to the, the the mountains and meditating but you know is it so crazy all that kind of stuff i i think um every now and then a digital detox at the bare minimum uh mm-hmm. should, should be done by everyone because it, it's amazing how how content and how relaxing uh, it is when you do that kind of thing. Uh, I'm trying to be insightful here. I think I'm failing miserably. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. I mean, dude, you you've definitely lived a lot more than um, than most people will in their entire lifetime, and you're still in your mid 30s. Um, you know, for some context, you've been like all over Africa. You've you've spent time in the desert, so you can compare desert and ocean, I, I suppose. Um, and, uh, I, I remember a tweet from you recently where you were kind of like, kind of searching for ideas for what to do next. Cause you've written books, you've done the sailing trips, you've, um, uh, done a lot of conquering and, um, yeah. Like, what do you, what do you think, uh, is the, the next chapter for you? You know, uh, this is kind of a, a hard one. Um, because. I said, I said the kind of the sexual conquest stuff was my twenties. I kind of, I don't, I feel like I got a lot of that poison out. I travel a lot as well, 120 countries. The business side of things, been successful as an entrepreneur. Uh, I would like to be more successful. Uh, that's an ongoing thing, you know, because uh, four bars are great now, but I feel like uh, I'm not there yet uh, where I want to be because the, the coronavirus, like I don't know how it didn't take out all the the bars, but now we're back stronger than ever. It's great. Things are looking, things are looking optimistic, but. You know, obviously I'm thinking about family and I used to be, I, I came back from the sailing trip thinking that children is kind of one part of uh, my life that I haven't, uh, one part of life that I haven't experienced. Um, and I feel like, I feel like that it'll give you a type of uh, a, a joy and contentment or a richness that is not found in, uh, you know, just pleasure seeking or adventuring a, a quiet contentment that's kind of you'll bring with you for the rest of your life um but i i used to be 100 percent sure i was one of kids and all that stuff but now i'm 36 and stuff and i'm i'm not actually sure anymore that i want that uh, i was gonna say haven't you been in malta for like several years now and i feel like the whole time you've been talking about okay now it's the time to have family. kids man dude yeah. just get to it yeah, well, uh, well, the thing, like I, I don't want to get into too much personal details. Let's just say I was getting to it, or our, our, the situation is uh, only recently though. The situation is I, I, mm. I've been actually rethinking things. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to get into it too much, but I, no, I, I'm actually, I'm actually because I'm thinking about a lot of other things about like how does this look in ten, twenty years, and I, I'm, uh, I'm grappling with that because I you know, they say you're never ready for kids. I knew that. And I kind of trust the process, but I don't know if I really am. Uh, I, I, it's not so much the kids, bit; it's the whole settled life thing. Um, are, is Malta starting to feel small? No, I love Malta. Life in Malta is great. Uh, it, it is tiny. It is small and it feels small, but you can always travel, you know, you're going to, it's like 10 euros to fly to Sicily, but uh, I've tra- I travel plenty. I travel plenty. So I don't, Really feel like that. I, I love the life here. Um, uh, could I could I live somewhere else? Yeah, I could. I, I wouldn't mind uh, travel. I could live in Bali for a bit, or I, I'd love to move back to Ireland. To be honest, I love Ireland, um, but it's impossible. The housing situation over there is disastrous, um, and the weather's terrible. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of feel after the sailing trip, I, I feel like my life for the first time in forever is a bit up in the air because. I kind of had always had these goals I was working towards. I now kind of feel like, okay, you I didn't have a next step. On the bucket list. I, I didn't have a next step after the sailing because that seemed like such a difficult thing to 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 do. 
Uh, and now that I've done it, I'm like, oh, ah, now what do I do? I mean, I'm interested in, like, I, I release, I, f- I finally finished the audiobook, my audiobook, which has took a lot of work, and I'm keeping myself busy with plenty of projects. Um, the, the, the video stuff, the, I'm going to focus a bit more on YouTube. I, I basically took a giant break from YouTube because I was focusing on the audiobook. But, um, mm. on, like, it's it, that's fun and all, um, running the business. I keep myself very busy, but in terms of, like, an overarching, plan it's the first time i kind of feel like it's a little bit up in the air you said uh, for north americans latham is the best place and i for that exact reason i i 100 agree with you if i was a north american latham would 100 be the uh be the play because it's so close uh if you age is so goddamn far even europe is pretty far i mean ireland's not that bad but uh, uh it is the the place that's the same reason why when i came back from new york uh, I had a desire to stay in Europe, so I went as far south as possible because of that proximity to your home country. Like, uh, I, I think people overestimate that. If you were living in Australia or New Zealand, like, trying to get home for weddings, funerals, you, you completely break away um, from from your life, really. So I, I do think that proximity is really important. I think I agree with you that Latin America is definitely the spot because uh, I don't think the Carib- Caribbean, compared to Latin Amer- Latin America, from the bits I've been to, I think they're much better. I think it's much better than uh, most of the Caribbean. 100%. You must be getting close to Malta citizenship, right? I think it's like five years of residency. Uh, I could get it, yeah. I don't really have an interest at the moment because, I mean, it's still a European Union passport. Uh, I might get it just for the crack, just just to have it. In yeah. case I never, never need to uh, escape a country. Um, yeah, I should actually look into it. Um it, it wouldn't offer me much value in terms of because uh, it's another European passport and I'm a resident here, but uh, but why not? If I can, I should. Yeah, there's definitely value to to any second passport, even yeah. a, a second passport in the in the EU. Yeah, I agree, uh, and I, I have thought about it, um, but I just haven't haven't uh, lit the fire under my arse yet. It must be. It should be probably coming up, so you should probably uh, start looking into it and see how you might need to uh organize a little bit to make that a reality i i can get it now for sure uh yeah that's cool and i like my my brother and my mom and dad moved over here as well so they're living uh here as well they 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 they, they love they love visiting me they're like oh we're just gonna move over um and they help out with the bars now and everything we've expanded that's the reason why it's expanded so rapidly um yeah so it's a good it's a good out life here now i have to say uh i'm not in a rush to go anywhere I think I obviously had a bought a place here, so I'll always have a base here. Uh, yeah, so it's all good. Life's good. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, I think we can kind of start to finish up there. I have no no exciting adventures planned in the immediate future. Uh, I'm going to be going back to Latin America at some point early next year because my friend, my my best friend Dan, who I was best man at his wedding. He actually bought a he bought a, a van, a convert you know, converted van, and he's going mm-hmm. from Alaska to Argentina. So he's doing the whole Pan American Highway right now as we speak. I think he's all the way down in he's in New Mexico now. He so he's done all Canada, Alaska, and he's gonna go all the way through South America. And then I think he's he's actually got a really, really a six figure job lined up in Peru. Um so he's gonna do all the continent and stuff. So I'm gonna probably join him and his wife. Uh, who were introduced? Uh, there, they, he lived in Oman. I actually introduced them, uh, or sorry, they, they, were, they were. I didn't introduce them, but anyway, actually, I'm not going to get into that story. But uh, yeah, they're traveling through, so I'm going to join them. They have his wife has a lot of contacts in Venezuela. Uh, she went to kind of a nice school and was with uh, her friends. Are kind of political. Uh, they, you know, they're high up in the political scene there, and they have a uh, quite the connections there. So it would be so cool to fly over and maybe in February and, and join for the Venezuela portion. So let's see. That's awesome, man. Um, thank you so much for joining us and, and, uh, you know, making my Latin life podcast where you finally shared in detail, uh, all the, uh, adventures from the, the Caribbean sailing journey, super, super epic. And, uh, thanks again for your time, man. And, uh, thanks uh, for joining us for your, your second appearance on the my Latin life podcast. It was an absolute pleasure. And uh, for those who want to uh, follow me, you can look at Naughty Nomad, Twitter, Instagram. Unfortunately, I just signed TikTok and uh, at the Naughty Nomad and I hate it already. 
Uh, <laughs> but you got to play the game now. And obviously YouTube, I'm really trying to, uh, YouTube is where I'm putting most of my focus. And I have a lot of awesome videos out there. I put up my first uh, my first trip, uh, my sailing trip one. I just put up another one of visiting uh, the gun markets where they make the guns in Pakistan. You know, the Afghan border went there as well. So a lot of exciting stuff going on there. Uh, yeah, check out the audiobook, My Life is a Mexican Pirate. Um, put a lot of work into it and people love it so far. Uh, you can check out the reviews. Um, yeah, and absolute pleasure uh, being on the podcast again. And hopefully I'll have more adventures in the future for you. Yeah, I've read uh, both of the adventure travel books and they're the type of book that you could get through in one or two sittings. It's absolutely addicting. Um one of the greatest minds in adventure travel, Mark Zolo. Thanks so much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Take care.